Not everyone's a grandmaster. But that doesn't mean these stars aren't some of the greatest creators and people in chess. Oh! <laughs> the poor eval bar. That was one of the most exhilarating games I've been a part of. Presenting the best of the best. <gasps> I feel the rook! <laughs> that aren't the best. Oh! Danny! Danny! The I'm Not a GM Speed Chess Championship 2022. Oh no! We've seen the first Botez Gambit. What a way to start off. Everyone yeah. would not be proud, Alex. Watch your favorite creators scramble. And now Levy's up. It's, it's me! me. One. It's me! Look at one's me! Oh my goodness! Blunder. <gasps> oh, Queen of Seven Mate! Queen of Seven Mate! And play some brilliancies. Wait, it's still me! Oh, what a my find! God. What a find, my lords! That was amazing! Watch live on chess.com slash TV. Welcome back to the I'm Not GM Speed Chess Championship. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess, alongside me today, my good friend, Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky. Danya, I don't think either player here needs any introduction whatsoever. These are two of the biggest content creators on the planet. I am Levy Rothman, aka Gotham Chess. I am Eric Brooks. Danya, how excited are you for today's action? Couldn't have asked for a better match to return to. Eric Rose and Levy Rosman. It's like pineapple on pizza, any amazing combinations, meat on bread. You are going to get an amazing match, guaranteed. We certainly are. We had a fun match yesterday to remind everybody that Paulina Shuvalova, the number one seed, she took down David Pruis. So she sets up a matchup in the quarterfinals against eight seed James Canty III. But right now, all of our attention is on the match between Levy Rosman and Eric Rosen. I mean, these two, they flew by their first round opponents, very popular commentators, streamers, you know, creators, and Nemo and Tanya Sachev. But Danya, this matchup, Levy, Eric, how do we choose between them? My goodness. I mean, they're both in great form. We were commentating Levy's first match against Nemo. I mean, he was just winning game after game. He was pulling out swindles. He was pulling out great opening preparation. And I am so excited to see the opening battle because both Levy and Eric, their fame is multifaceted. But one aspect of their fame is, of course, their fabled opening preparation both of them will come armed with a tremendous amount of ideas so impossible to choose who the favorite is but i think a lot is going to depend on whose opening preparation I hope i'm allowed to say it is sexier <laughs> <laughs> you certainly are and levy he has played it looks like six times the amount of games on chess.com in the last year both players lined up at 82 percent average accuracy but look at those losses by flag Donya. you are a speed demon Eric, he has historically lost quite a large percentage of his games by time, but he has improved his bullet game tremendously in recent months. He definitely has, and it is entirely possible that this match comes down to the bullet, perhaps even comes down to an overtime. Not that they've ever had a match before that, <laughs> that got close. Absolutely not. I'm just, you know, pulling that out hypothetically. But absolutely, Eric will have to watch the flag. One of the reasons that Nemo was struggling as much as she was against Levy was because of the clock. Levy knows how to create problems. He knows how to put pressure on the clock. And when he turns it on, he's one of the fastest players on chess.com. I mean, he can play incredibly fast, and Eric will have to be incredibly vigilant in that regard. 
He will because they players to remind everyone of the format. There are 75 minutes of five plus one. That's five minutes of the one second increment followed by 45 minutes of three plus one. And last but not least, we get bullet for 25 minutes. And we're going to bring up the smarter chess stats brought to us by chessgoals.com because if we go section by section, it is all knotted up except in the longest time control. That's where smart chess gives Eric Rosen the nod. I don't even know what to, I don't even know what to make of this. I don't know. I agree with the idea that this is going to be a very close match. I don't know if I agree that every segment is going to be even. If I had to make a prediction, for some reason, I'm feeling like there's going to be lopsided scores in the five and three minute portions, but that they're going to cancel each other out. I'm just getting that sense. And then it's all going to come down to the bullet. We're going to get overtime and Armageddon match, and we're going to be yelling and falling out of our chairs. That's what's <laughs> going to happen today. Well, you said coming down the bullet, overtime, extra chess for all. So let's send us back in time. We're going to go back a year ago and revisit the matchup that we saw in last year's I'm Not Jim Speeches Championship between these very two players, Levy Rosman and Eric Rosen. 1.6 seconds for Levy. I mean, is someone going to flag this game? It really feels like it. Oh, I got 1.8. He barely got that move off. Three seconds for Eric. He plays H run. That's a good move. Pawn chain. Rook F5, another good move. Keep your piece defended. Now the seventh rank is scary. Pawn goes down. Rook B7, Rook D7 to follow. Rook D6 here. Probably wins G6. I think that's this king. This king can come into the position. King F6, King G5, King F4. Careful of that king. Oh my gosh. King takes G4. Whose pass pawn is better? Who's I don't know, but. Worse? Don't play Rook G3. G6 is hanging. Rook E2 is almost mate, though. Yeah, it's almost mate. So he plays Rook D2 and Rook E8 going for Rook E2. 0.4 seconds. seconds. How is that even possible? <laughs> oh, they go with 0.1 seconds. He barely How got that move How is this possible? I Someone's have no flag. idea. And now Levy's up a point. It's, it's mate. One. It's mate. Rook F1's mate. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I knew. Bishop F4. Keep that E3 pawn. Queen D5, King H8. Oh, my gosh. But you have the pawn. But Rook to D1, take over that open file. You have Rooks. Use them. And Queen somewhere, you just need to figure out where to knock him out. And 1.3 seconds, I oh barely my goodness. got it off. Both of these players are just almost losing on the spot. Queen D4 check, Rook D7 coming Rook, up. Yeah, Queen D5 check. Queen, Careful, Queen D1 mate. Trade, trade every... <gasps> Queen, Queen D1! Made. Queen D1! Oh my gosh, and Levy spots it. What a swindle. It. Oh my gosh. What a swindle, because Robert, all he had to do was play Queen takes F7 with a check. Queen F7 check. He needed to take the rook, but he took it the wrong way. And what a move by Levy Rosman. And oh my gosh, Queen H2 check is King F1. What a way to weasel out of this for Levy. Yes, because he's playing on the light squares. Now every piece is safe. King F1, you can play. Queen H2, Whoa, Queen H2, Queen H2, 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 H2. Oh, he walked right into it. And he had no time. And he shakes his head, gets up and bounces. And Eric's like, all right, it's, it's chill. We're still it, just playing Eric, chess? <laughs> Eric's just pouring another cup of tea. I mean, it's just a day in the office. I don't know where more is, but maybe there is more. King of Chu, does that secure the draw at this point? He and, is thinking about Bishop F1, but he should not play that move. He did oh, it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. And he does it. Wait, he Bishop C5 check. Oh, oh, no, he missed, he missed it without King F2. King F2, bring your king back. Bishop C5. And, Wait, is there D2 Bishop, winning? Bishop takes A3. Oh, D2 as well. D2 is wow. winning. Wow. And that decision by Eric, he shook his head. The first real reaction we've seen from him he was like i can't believe that just happened i played bishop f1 was so unnecessary oh. he didn't need to do that you just be okay with the draw and go to the next game and there has to be a checkmate in the next few moves so levy rosman against all odds he was down three points at some moment here he goes checkmate next move and there it is. that is the match and look at levy he is elated there is a fist bump he's gone i started jumping around his room i feel sorry for whatever objects he has around him they're probably breaking right now Holy smokes, the, the emotions finally pour out because they've been bottled in the entire match. Rosen and Rosman just gave us probably one of the best treats. And the rematch is here. Just a reminder to everybody, this was the final score a year ago. It was in Levy Rosman's favor, 13.5, 10.5. But, Danya, as you kind of called out, you weren't sure if the smart chess predictions for this year would be correct. Levy, he lost the 5 plus 1 and the 3 plus 1, and then he was able to overtake Eric in the bullet. And that's what makes these formats magical. You get three different formats. You wipe the slate clean after each of them, and you have different rhythms, different tenors of the game. And, uh, I mean, how can you not get a ridiculously entertaining match given the format? 
and given the closeness in strength of these two players. Yeah, and they really have been giving all the fans such great entertaining content but we can never forget that these are two exceptional chess players and eric he played in the Reykjavik open he had some really nice games there levy has been playing in some round robin norm events and he's focused on his content creation both players that's where most of their time uh, resides but danya i mean we're about to see them go toe to toe over the board in the rematch that everybody has been waiting for Levi rosenman here we go <laughs> Oh, goodness. And look at Levy, by the way. He was wearing a hoodie last year. Now he's got, uh, you know, this kind of tank uh -oh. top looking thing going he's, he's on He's coming to play. I mean, he's not messing around today. Yeah, and Eric, you know, he's just cool it, as a cucumber, as per usual. He, he's got the comfy sweatshirt. I can guarantee he's probably got a fireplace running. Nice cup of tea. He's got the tea kettle on his desk so he can, you know, refill after a time scramble where most people would either destroy mouses or uh, throw fist pumps. So over under on whether Eric refills his T five times or more. <laughs> the games are on. <laughs> Anyways, here we go. Levy with the white pieces in game one. And we got 75 minutes of five plus one starting now. I'm going with the under, but we do have an English opening here. A very standard fare from the start. And Levy, he goes E3 here, and that's this is known. So D5, it looks like you're just blundering a pawn. White has three pieces aimed at that square, but because the tactic involving the move knight to B4, Black is happy to get this move in. Yeah, and this actually can get very, very dangerous for White. CD5, knight B4, and Black is already threatening knight D3. And if you can get bishop F5 in under good circumstances, Black's going to be all over the queen side and all over these light squares. And we see CD5 knight before has happened. So you do not want to allow that knight to sink its teeth into the D3 square. Your king will have to move and the light squares will be vulnerable here. There's no easy way to defend the D5 on any of you. You'd have to go queen to B3, but that welcomes that knight to D3, not to mention your bishop F5 type of moves as well. And so Levy settling for D3, Eric recapturing the pawn. He's already up a minute on the clock. And I like what Levy just did there. He said, it's more important for me to get a playable position than to try to cling to my extra pawn. And I think he's managed to escape Eric's preparation, but Black is pretty happy here. I mean, good position, good pieces. I would probably take Black by, by a smidge. Yeah, because D3, it's not going to be lost just yet or anything, but it's a forever target. If you ever push the pawn to D4, which may be White's idea after castling, and then try to rid yourself of your weakest pawn on the board, a Black's pieces, they're all on great squares. There's no harm in the position whatsoever. And all right, Levy's going to strike with Bishop B2, but that E5 pawn's already defended. It just feels like Black is extremely solid. Yeah, and Eric will probably get his Bishop out. He does. We might see H3, Bishop H5. And Black's plan is quite simple here. I think queen d7, rook d8, and as you were uh, indicating, just exert pressure on really the only target on the board for either side. It's this pawn on d3. That's right. And white does need to be careful about a sacrifice in the e3 square, because if you're not paying enough attention and uh, you, maybe bishop takes e3, followed by knight takes, and you get uh, the rook and a couple pawns with two pieces, but for the moment, there's bishop takes d5 as a response to bishop takes e3, so it's not hanging just yet. Yeah, and you also want to be very careful about a knee-jerk move like g4. You already have one target. If you make more weaknesses on the king side, ideas like queen h4, and as you pointed out, bishop takes e3, could ultimately become overwhelming. And I'm already getting a little concerned for Levy's clock. He's down to three minutes, and Eric with stellar opening preparation in game one. Yeah, actually, if you, you don't mind if we can bring up the analysis board. I, yeah. I think there's a line there with g4, bishop g6, and d4. If you go ed, knight takes d4, I think there's already knight takes e3 and the lights might go out for white. And after fe3, you just want to go rook e3. Exactly. With tremendous threats, in particular rook d3, and that simply might be unstoppable. You lose the knight. Good illustration of the danger inherent in white's position. And Levy, you know, he calmly plays queen c2, getting out of the pin, not inviting the bishop to g6 where it wants to go anyway. So I think that's a very good decision. And queen d7 by Eric, as we expected. Rook is probably going to come to d1, but that, that increases the likelihood of bishop takes c3, which might result in some sort of family fork if you're not careful. 
And now it's actually available because bishop e3, the antidote to that was bishop takes d5. But now in the event of this kind of sequence, maybe there's pawn takes d5, you take on e3, and queen takes h3, and it's getting really dangerous for that king over there on g1. And with these types of sacrifices, it's important to remember that you already have two pawns for the piece. So the stakes aren't actually that high. You don't have to have checkmate. So this is definitely possibly on the horizon and a big, big committal move by Levy e4. What do you make of this? Yeah, it's not one you want to play. And Eric goes back to c7, trying to get to e6 and d4, but the e5 Ooh. pawn is loose. So uh, this move, you know, you really would like to get the knight to d4, but you have to watch out for that pawn. And so you could play f6, but perhaps Levy wants to jumpstart his kingside activity with f4. That does seem incredibly dubious given just how vulnerable White's position is. Oh, and Levy finds, or Eric finds an alternate route. He goes through Paris rather than Frankfurt. <laughs> I completely <laughs> forgot about knight to b5. We, we, yeah, me too. <laughs> we were obviously looking at the d4 square, but you want to centralize your knight, but knight on b5 is well positioned to go right to d4. And the, the point, everybody, is look at that bishop on g2. It's a bad bishop. You know, it does stare into a good pawn. You like to say that, but it's a permanently bad bishop. Whereas once the pieces get traded on d4, that pawn on d3 is stuck in place. It's going to be a forever target. And here, black can decide to take on f4, bring a bishop back to c7, or just play the move f6 and keep the status quo. The email bar continues to drop, but I actually like the move f4 by Levy. I think it's the best practical chance. You need some activity because this d4 square is going to kill you otherwise. And this forces Black to make a decision, right? Eric has to decide whether to put something on d4, whether to play bishop c7. Levy trying to unbalance the position as best he can, but Eric playing so confidently so far. His position looks amazing. That bishop's about to land e5. Bishop c7, step oh. one. If you want to trade queens on d4, have at it. You'll be my friend. You're going to help me go after d3 pawn later. But if you move your king out the way, which is kind of necessary, it's looking like the bishop just goes right to e5. You think you're going for checkmate. No, no, no. You're walking discoveries where black is going to exploit the fact that the queen is in line with the black bishop. And queen takes d4. Some of you might say, oh, I can just trade queens and I'm fine. Well, no, you're not fine because hopefully you haven't forgotten about the d3 pawn, and here black piles up with the rook, threatens bishop takes f4, and this endgame is nothing short of miserable. Maybe it's white's best chance, but man, I don't know anybody who would go for that, and king h1 as predicted by levy. Let's, let's not blunder. Bishop takes f4, rook takes f4, knight e2. Fork. I Ooh, won the exchange. Fork. Yeah, let's Ain't do it. Oh, <laughs> uh, don't miss the checkmate. Oopsies. A <laughs> eh, small blunder. We, yeah, we all make know. mistakes. f6 by Eric. And now that is a threat. So we just showed you why it didn't work. The counter by white is no longer available, but the diagonal is open. That could also be useful for Levy in this position. Let me tell you, in this position, I actually would take on g6. Then I would take twice on d4 and try to get this bishop around to e2 and essentially ask black uh, how you're going to break through. Is it miserable? Absolutely. But otherwise, with 45 seconds, Robert, I don't see Levy pulling this out in a middle game. He needs to get a position where he can make a lot of moves relatively quickly. And you're just wanting the opposite color bishop ending. I get that. It's still bad for white, although after rook d2, it's saying it's getting even worse. Uh, but I'm with you that the opposite color bishop gave more chances and easier moves. Well, that ship has sailed, Eric, withdrawing his bishop to f7. And now you can no longer get opposite colored bishops. Oh, now bishop f492. Oh gosh, that it, the rook on from d2 got in the way of the rook on f1, so uh, bishop f4 was available there, missed, but still very good position for Eric. That d3 pawn that has to fall, right? Eventually, which you also don't want to cash in too soon, right? You want to wait until all of the lottery numbers are read out before you cash in. Maybe you want a million dollars rather than $10. Uh, well, it looks like he might be cashing in because he yeah. can go right for the d3 pawn. But there is counterplay. I'm totally with you. If bishop f4, rook f4, you see what I'm saying? Three, yeah. There might g5 be five later. Exactly that. G or e5, and the bishop on f7 is loose on the square. So Levy, he's doing a good job on the board, but he is down two minutes. So things are not getting easier for him. But given the time situation, I would put on my Russian schoolboy hat. I would go back to d4. And it's easier said than done, but maybe black can make a series of small improving moves like queen d6, maybe throw in h6 to discourage g5. Of course, white could potentially respond with h4. But this is a big moment, and Eric is definitely calculating bishop f4, queen d3. I'm not a huge fan of cashing in just yet, though. Yeah, it does make white's next few moves easier. It's not going to be a fun position for white necessarily, but there is ease. 
that comes with the liquidation. So I do think, as you're pointing out, Knight back to D4 looks like a great start, then play H6. And Eric, he's a player of your own heart, and he's going for it. I like it. I think this is a money decision. Levy with 15 seconds. I mean, he's just not going to be able to defend this for the next 25 moves. And now a move like H6, maybe rookie seven, just solidify your position. Keep waiting for a better opportunity to go after the D3 pawn. Right, just do not lose sight of that bishop on F7 because we're focused on G5 for white, trying to pry open the F file. There are two rooks in the row. You need to open up that line. So H6 just completely stops that idea. I like that move a lot. And I think that Eric, if he's going to continue to be patient here, that's a very useful move. And he plays rookie seven, the other that's improving great. move we mentioned. Mm -hmm. What hurts white as well is that H4 is never really possible because G4 hangs. The one thing that might be working in Levy's favor, Eric's clock starting to drop. He's now below a minute. Okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> well, his knight goes right back to B3, and he can go back to D4 if he wants. He can trade on B2 and be better than him. He cashes in. You were saying you didn't like this idea, and the no. reason why is... Whoa, whoa, what is he doing, comes. Bishop? I mean, look at this. He's, he's done it in the worst possible version. He could have had the same position with the queens off the board, and Levy's just winning now. Yeah, he's just breaking open the king. Around. I mean, it's clearly over to FG, queen g5, hits the rook on e7, and queen g7 with checkmate. So that is a double threat that you cannot defend against. This is just clearly loss, and oh snap your fingers, the result of the game changes. And it's not just over just yet. GF, though, calm move by Levy. And now Eric's rooks. Oh! Oh, oh! oh my gosh. Take two, oh, and then take f7. Oh! oh! And if queen d6, you simply take the entire house. You take d8, you take f7, as you said, and g7 falls with mate. That was nasty. I mean, he could have just taken an f4 and had a winning position that way. Rook takes f7 now. That Just don't take the rook. Take f7 first. Oh, even better. Rook f8, mate is coming. Filigree precision by Levy. Five seconds, I don't care. I'm still playing like a boss, and he's going to take the first game. And that's Gotham style for you, baby. You roll with the punches. You punch back when the time is right. And that is a win for Levy Rosman. I mean, just now you can you go E8 equals Take queen. everything. <laughs> yeah, rook D7. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, have fun with it. <laughs> and I was just making sure that Levy didn't like flag or anything. Yeah, because the result came in after Eric made his move. And now we get a Karakon in game two. And the storyline of that last game is more common than one might think, right? Eric, he was improving, improving. He was patient, patient, patient. And eventually, he probably spotted his clock, and he just got frustrated. He couldn't find a way forward, decided, ah, let me just take on D3 now, and just underestimated the potential energy of White's pieces. What a turnaround, and what a defensive effort by Levy. Yeah, and I understand that frustration, right? You're looking at your position, you know you're better, and then you want to say, I don't just want to have an aesthetically pleasing position. I want material. Give it to me. But it allowed Levy's position to open up, and it really came back to haunt Eric. So now here in game two, we have those double pawns, and this Gurgan needs this system, the F7, F6 pawns. End games will not be very good for Black, but we're very far from a situation like that. And look at Levy. He's playing on the queen side right now, he's going to have to figure out where his knight and light square bishop should go. But he goes to a6, he'll go to c7, and that will allow bishop e6 a trade without further uh, inducing more weaknesses from your pawn structure. Yeah, white center visually is more impressive, but black is trying to use his pieces to take control of the of this constellation of light squares in the center. d5, c4, e4, and I kind of like the way Eric is handling this, but he might have walked into a move like b5. If... Levy can toss this bishop away from the A2GA diagonal and get control of that diagonal himself. Black will have succeeded in his opening aims. And Levy so just puts that knight on d5 and please take me there. I'll get an isolated pawn, but I'll get the pair of bishops. So, Donia, the bishop on g7, I think that's what would frustrate a lot of people here. They want to play f5, but that gives white control of some very important squares, g5 and e5. So there's no rush to help that bishop on g7. Uh, maybe later in the game, you'll find a better path for it. Well, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but this bishop, it's controlling important squares. It's safeguarding Black's king. That's important, too. You're not going to get any brilliancy prizes for that job. But, you know, the bishop on g7 makes Black's position run. Yes. And now that bishop came out to e6, as you were advocating for. Now, the queen should probably just slide back to c2. If you go over to a3, you could even get trapped at the rook e8, bishop f8. But as you're Ooh. pointing out, knight c4 as well is very direct. Now, c4 is another possibility expanding in the center, but it comes with great responsibility. 
The D4 pawn is weakened. There is a pin that you walk into. But I actually think concretely this works out for Eric because he's going to play bishop c3. He's going to get his rooks into the game. He can also drop his queen back and try to restrict the knight further by playing his pawn to b3. Yeah, I really like that move c4. It wasn't that intuitive to me because the d4 pawn feels a little bit loose. But let's not forget about that pawn in a5. The rook on a8 is stuck in place. Okay, not anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was stuck in place so long as the bishop was staring at it. But now there is a very direct threat. D5, as you're pointing out, you've protected D4, overprotected. You can bring rook to D1 or rook to C1 and then figure out how to go forward from there. Actually, Black's move here is not easy with D5 being no. such a huge threat. Well, I guess the question is, do you move your knight or do you move your bishop? But there's a clear drawback to both. You take your eyes off of the D5 square. And if you move your bishop, white could very well still play D5. Yeah, where's your bishop even going to? I guess you have to go to F5. Yeah. And I almost want to trap the bishop. You know, with D5, if your knight goes to D7, your bishop's starting to oh. run out of squares. And then G4 was a very serious possibility. Eric goes with the patient rook AC1. Levy mm -hmm. activating his own rook. And now the big question for Eric, when does he play D5? And I think he's ready to play it on the next move. Yeah, because now he can follow D5 with D6, and he can just get a pass pawn storming up the center here. And Black's pieces are being kicked backwards. So d5 is levy gonna play c5 perhaps or maybe knight d7 maybe he's trying to take control of these dark squares and prevent d6 we'll see no you're right he plays c5 and not a bad idea actually yeah this knight on b6 might go c8 to d6 right you would love to blockade pass pawns with a knight you can also of course just play bishop to d6 uh the question i'm, I'm having though is what about this pawn on f6 like that bishop was helping protect the king side is there a way that white can try to hit that pawn over there and cause some issues well, you could consider queen c3 he plays queen a3 though which doesn't look very visually appealing and i don't really see how it discourages black's main plan and you could also put a bishop on d6 yeah and then retreat the knight to d7 that's another possible setup okay levy goes there but for some reason that move is not approved of can I don't see anything that white can do to punish. I think this is no. a thematic decision that I have no problem with, even if the engine says otherwise. Zero problems with. And I, I think the engine is perhaps slightly overvaluing uh, the pass pawn on d5, which is about to get totally blockaded by this knight. Right. And we need to throw b6 in. We understand that because the c5 pawn is a little bit loose, but black wants to make a move like that anyway. So uh, bishop d3, you can just take on d3. He goes back. Interesting decision oh, there. There right? was... <laughs> yeah. There was a ridiculous tactic with bishop takes h3. Actually, gh and rookie three. Oh my gosh. If we you, pull up the board here for a second. Yeah, you love just sacrificing pieces, but it hey, makes weak, perfect weak sense. in the sun has reactivated my tactical senses. Then you start mopping everything up in the king's side. Anyways, that will remain behind the scenes. But and maybe okay. an important miss as this match continues because we do expect a close match. So uh, any opportunity that is not taken could be one that uh, you regret. So here we see the queen came to D2. There's no more rook takes E3 stuff happening, at least not yet. And mm -hmm. as you're pointing out, bishop f4 can help uh, you know, kick that queen away. But where to from here? That's the question both sides are struggling with, right? Like this bishop came to f4. The knight just blocks on the square it wants to be on. The knight on f3, that's my problem piece for white, and I don't know where it should go instead. Maybe h2, maybe eventually it can go to d2, but at the right moment, black might have to play f5, and maybe then the knight will return to f3 to take control of the e5 square. So a move I would consider here, something like queen c2 followed by knight d2. I like the look of that. Instead, we see a, an attempt to double on the e5. I like that too. Yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. Rookie eight, do not play that move. No. <laughs> Bishop takes d6 immediately, or queen takes e8, both win material. So queen came to d7, which allows for rook to e8. And also the knight can move to f5. So, but the problem for black is you want your knight and your pawn on f5 at the same time. <laughs> right? right. Like you, you want to open up the bishop, but you don't want to take the f5 square away from the knight unless you're quickly going to get f5, rook e8, knight e4 all at once. Right. And you certainly don't want to give white's knight a, an easy pathway to c6. Black could also consider bishop f8 and say, okay, I'm going to give you the e-file, but I'm going to claim that there are no infiltration squares. But Levy going rook e8, he doesn't mind a rook trade. I think he's doing a great job of holding this position together. Right. And when we assess this, of course, white is the side that showed the better chances because you have a pass pawn in d5. And we talked about this from the very start of the opening. Double f pawns, not 
ideal for an end game, but with the blockade in place, no pawn breaks elsewhere on the queen side and black with an extra pawn on the king side, it's not clear how white intends to go from an advantage to a win. Oh, I'm getting a spam call. Nice. <laughs> cool. Let me uh, m remove my phone from over here. I was getting one a little bit earlier. Levy with h5, preventing knight g4. And the reason I think that this move gave him pause is, of course, because g6 is now a little bit weakened. But this is where, Robert, you were pointing out the virtues of the doubled pawns. That f7 pawn is indispensable toward keeping the health of Black's kingside pawn structure. But Eric continues dancing around with his knight, looking for entry points, and perhaps eventually aiming to trade knights by getting it to e4. I mean, we haven't spoken about this game, but it's probably going to be a theme of the match. Look at the clocks. Levy down under 50 seconds. Eric at over two minutes. Eric is the faster player, but his speed, maybe he was a bit hasty in game one. It came back to uh, hurt him. Now in game two, he's slightly better, but with no clear prospects of a breakthrough. And it's one of those positions, I mentioned this in the last game, where Levy can, if he really, really wants to, make a bunch of moves pretty darn quickly. He can keep himself over 30 seconds on the clock and i think he should is he repositioning his bishop to d6 looks like it and there's no way to get to this b6 pawn you would love to play bishop c7 oh. obviously the knight covers that oh. you would you know even think about going bishop b8 bishop a7 but your bishop might get caught over there and you could even eventually lose it so knight to d1 played i, I don't see any infiltration possible whatsoever none and i don't think levy should play with fire i think he should just preserve the status quo he might be a little bit worried about knight c3. So he induces f4, and now he's going to go back. But knight c3, then he's going to go f5. f5. Now's the time. Not yeah. that knight e4 was that scary, but why allow it? Right. Just look at this. We like to you know, think, where do our pieces go? What are the realistic dream squares? Um, nowhere is what my answer is right now. Eric declined to draw, by the way, with king f2, which is understandable. He's up a minute on the clock. He can press this. Without any risk, maybe he can try to get his bishop to e5 eventually, induce another weakness with f6. That's a really good idea. This knight on c3, it was on f3 before. Where can that knight go? You would like to get that knight to e5, or he goes to b5. Black can even take that thing, right? That might have been a little bit hasty, because that knight is one of the chisels with which you can get into Black's position. With only bishops, I don't see how you make any progress if Black parks the king on e7. Right, and... It's not happening anytime soon, but watch out for a5 to a4. Right? If you're not paying enough attention, the b3 pawn gets distracted. If that knight's in contact with a c4 pawn, that could spell disaster for white. But for now, everything's locked up. But Eric continues to make inroads on the king side. He's traded off all of the pawns. But where does he go from here? He's probably going to give a check on g5. Three seconds for Levy. Bishop g5, pawn f6, barely keeping everything together. He goes I like bishop that move. b2, restricting the knight. King g6. Oh, uh -oh. this is starting to get a bit uncomfortable. Maybe there's bishop e5, and maybe black can turn this around. And even if black loses the e5 pawn, it's probably still a draw, but black shouldn't lose it. After takes, takes king f5, I think you can just play king d6. Right, and it's not a great bishop on d3. Can't attack a single thing, so maybe black can even play for a little bit more. Especially if the bishop on d3 abandons the pawn on c4. Your earlier idea, a5, a4, could come with great effect, but Robert, he's got three seconds. Yeah, that's the worrisome part about this, but he can just pre-move like knight d6 and yeah. things like that. It's really hard to blunder in this position for Levy. And Eric, I'm sure he's desperately searching for a way to make things tricky. Oh, watch out for knight e5. Speaking of tricky, <laughs> knights, don't mess with them. And bishop f5. Oh, uh -oh a4, a4. a4 next. All right. Oh, he okay. misses it. He missed it, but a4 is there. You have to be very, very careful. And it's going to be there again. And that f pawn is going to rumble forward if you're not careful. It does, but will he lose it? I think he might lose it. But even if he loses it, if the bishops get traded, as you pointed earlier, light square bishop with all these pawns is not going to allow you to win this game. But I don't like f3. I thought he should have played bishop e5 and used that as a bargaining chip. Traded dark square bishops. Now he's just going to lose it for no uh -oh. compensation. Yeah, now he's in some trouble. I even thought bishop d4 earlier was possible to get knight b7 to c5. Uh-oh. Oh, bishop h4. His king oh, is no. tossed away. And here comes the white king. And here comes the other bishop. Bishop but it's e still not a bishop d8. Oh, a4. And there's a4. But it's Only too late, chance. unfortunately. Can you just take on b6, take on c5? Or is that... Maybe it's a little much. d6, knight takes d6, bishop takes b6. I think that's the way. I don't think you want to sack the bishop on b6. No, but this is over. King e4. Unfortunately, and Levy's position collapses. The whole thing is falling down. Bishop takes b6, bishop back to e3 if you need to stop the pawn at any moment. Or... You can take c4 if you want. Yeah, that'll just push your pawns. 
in a very frustrating sequence there for Lucky, who defended. Oh, Queen, bang. Yeah, Levy, uh, he let that one get away because of his clock situation. And Eric adjusting, right? First game, he got really impatient. This game, he waited for his opportunity. And how many pass pawns does the guy need? Yeah, how many queens does the guy need? Queenie five checkmate wasn't good enough. And there Maybe it seven is. checkmate is. <laughs> one yeah. one. Tied match. And I would say that from the perspective of the players, that Levy should be frustrated with losing that game because he was pretty solid throughout that entire sequence of trading queens, of first trading rooks, then queens, and all that stuff. And it looked like he should never lose. And then his time trouble caught up to him. Well, I almost feel like the moment when he didn't play A4, and that's totally understandable. You've been defending the whole game. You're not even really looking for these ideas that turn the table. But once he missed that opportunity, something shifted in the position. I can't really tell what it is. It was still a draw, but the defensive task was getting progressively more difficult. Good well, stuff there by Eric. Well, also, Levy didn't have to push his F-pawn. Like, he kind no. of created his own doom by throwing that pawn up the board and then losing it. So he could have just moved his bishop back and forth, and he was in no danger of losing that game. It was a knee-jerk reaction, but that pawn had no supervision, no chaperones, no parental supervision. Uh, yeah. Well, you so don't this need one's parental colorless supervision. Queen's yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> this is not even PG. This is rated no, G. No, no, like, no. This is the calmest of calm positions ever. And... What do you got for me here? Because I got nothing. <laughs> well, I think it's time to take a nap while this game is going. No, no, no. It's just uh, getting started. They're, they're <laughs> feeling each other out, waiting to see what's going to happen. So E4 is a break that White could look for. I wouldn't go for that here because then White would be left with an isolated D pawn. Now, Black has claimed important space on the queen side. Watch out for B5, Knight B6, Knight C4. And that Knight gets an outpost over there because the pawn is on A3. It doesn't go back. I... I don't know if I, I like that. I don't love that. Yeah, I agree. I think Eric created a complex of light squares that he could have occupied, but I still don't think this is Levy's style. He doesn't like these, you know, slow maneuvering positions. I was expecting him to play one E4 almost exclusively this match. But I guess he's very solid. I mean, knight E5. Wait, uh, I, the I didn't even, is still ahead. I didn't even know the name of this opening. Queen's Gambit Decline Exchange positional line positional that's how you line. know you should never play it if it's called the positional line excuse me this is a speed chess matchup i want my refund give me my money back you're not playing the positional line yeah i play the sicilian knight of two would you play i play the king's indian hey how about you i play the queen's game declined positional line <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness well eric is moving very quickly and that is a big move because once Black takes on Passant. The A3 pawn is loose, but so is the B7 pawn. And if look at the pawn chain, B7 to D5, a pawn chain only as strong as his base pawn. So White would love to remove B7 and then target C6. And that A A3 pawn isn't just dead weight. It can shift up to A4 at some point to further hammer away at Black's pawn chain. But now, speaking of hammering away, Knight E5 hits the weakest pawn on the board, which is C6. Yes, and there is this knight on c3 that would like to move, but don't move it just to target c6. Your rook on e1 is loose. So be very careful here. If black puts a rook on c8, you don't just get to move that knight away and target the pawn. And your good friend, I am Teddy Coleman. We welcome him in the chat, making a great point. That knight on f8, it would, what it wouldn't give to be on d6 right now, and I think you kind of called it knight of fate, was a moment in which things kind of subtly started turning a little bit around. Right. But we are playing the positional line. So we yes. had to make moves like knight to f8. It was of course, a requirement. h6 and king h8. And we must play very prophylactic is, slow moves. Oh, bishop takes a3 is possible because rook a1 pins the bishop, tries to win it. Black has the move b4 at the end. But then knight to b1 oh. is a nasty move. That is a move in the true spirit of the positional line. <laughs> and Black's entire queen side kind of collapses here. No, Black is in a horrible position after this. So, yeah, you cannot just go snag a pawn just because you want it. So, Bishop takes a3 is not good. Knight to e6. Look, okay, there it is. It looks perfectly reasonable. And then Rook to c8. But it feels like Black might be tied down to the defense quite a bit here. Yeah, Knight e2 is a nice move. It reinforces the Bishop opening up an attack on c6. But what is Levy's follow-up going to be to Rook c8? Another idea you don't want to fall asleep on, Robert, is c6, c5. Under the right circumstances... This could be a little bit tough to handle for White, especially if his pieces don't have good coordination. 
And Bishop takes A3 now actually is a threat because the problem with that line was the knight was coming back to B1 to then yep. go win the bishop. But now after bishop A3, pawn B4, everything is safe and sound on the queen side and you were just able to steal that pawn. Great point. What about rook BC3? Can you counterattack the C6 pawn like that? Okay, so you're leaving me with a lot to calculate there. Rook C3, if I take on A3, exactly. you're, you're, as you said, you're going right after C6. I guess knight D8 is not out of the question after rook to C3. Oh, he goes Bishop H2. Not and remember, a move that inspires confidence. Remember how Teddy was talking about that Knight D6, Knight C4? I think we might even see Knight D2, Knight C4. Oh, he spoke it into existence. Yeah, and that's a big problem for white because C6 is no longer a target, and that pawn on A3 certainly is. But a problem for black that Eric has to not fall asleep on. Knight takes D5 is a massive threat. And you don't really want to part ways with this knight. Knight D6. What do you do? Knight D6. Protect that oh, rook. Oh, when you protect the rook. Yeah, so knight takes D5 is that. out of the question. And then I go knight C4. And oh, I no, really don't like that choice. Right. That was oh. a big mistake. Oh, gosh. No, this is going to get really bad for black now. And the point is, after bishop A3, does white just passively move the rook? No, no, no. It's time for knight takes C6 and all sorts of shenanigans. And this is close to lost for black. Yes, and... You know, even without these captures of pawns, watch out for queen to f5. Such an easy uh -oh. move to forget about because f7 is hanging and you can't move your knight back to d8 because your rook on c8 is loose. So that might be a devastating threat. That knight on e6 is just sort of staring at the pawn on d4. It's neither here nor there. And it's a big problem for black. Eric might have to bite the bullet, clench his teeth, and play c5, come what may. Oh, gosh. Oh, he took on a3. Yeah, that's... Not what you really want to do. He probably felt like he had to do it. And rook a1, as you're pointing out, you could start with that. Or knight takes c6 also is good. Still at a Apparently, plus one and a half. But not as winning as I thought it would be. How does black even defend against knight e7? Do you have to play rook 8 takes c6? Oh, you play rook a takes c6. Mm. Ah, because you can keep trading? No. No, because, because see of... the problem at the end of this line is, this is that... Bishop d6 at the end, right? Or, or maybe a check on yes, e8. Check there. Bang, and you just take everything on the king side. It's so interesting yes. that queen c8 didn't work, but queen e8 is right. And the like, reason why is that after h6, you have to be able to take then on f7. Wait, but, that's same but you would have been able to do the same thing. Right, so what was the difference with queen c8 and queen e8? Oh, it's just block oh, on g8. Queen e8. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to be as close as possible to the black king. Easy to miss, by the way. Yeah. You know, we, we sort of think, oh, we, Knight of Fate is forced. We both missed it, right? So uh, we'll say it's easy to miss. That way we feel better about ourselves. But Knight takes 66 was played. Uh, I think that your first instinct of Rook 8 or Rook C takes C6 is the way to go because the Rook takes 6, there is Bishop takes C1 there. And uh-oh, oh, I made the wrong choice. And they're going to go exactly down the line that we just described. Yeah, no, this is now straightforward. Queen takes pre-move or not. And queen e8 check is coming. And the last big roadblock. And it's really important that the bishop goes to d6 because queen e1 would be checkmate, right? Not just a check down there. The king has no escape square. So bishop d6 threatens checkmate of your own and avoids falling for back rank problems. And Levy, even if you didn't see queen d8, queen e8 is just the move you want to play because it eliminates unnecessary risk that there will be some sort of interference. That's right. And now queen f8, queen f7, and followed by bishop e5. The d5 oh. pawn is loose as well. Uh, White's just winning all the material. Bishop takes f8. I can see the temptation of that move as well. But, but queen takes f8 is just more forcing. Yeah, because I think he's thinking bishop f8, if the king goes to h7, then I take on f7 and I go for checkmate very directly. But after bishop takes f8, there will be some discoveries. But as you're pointing out, queen e1 check, uh, then White needs to find, like, where is that knockout blow afterwards? Yeah, then you might have to go back to a3 and try to pick up the bishop on c1, but that is so much less clean than simply taking with the queen. And that rhymes, so <laughs> I'm happy. I think he's going to take with the bishop. He's thinking so long. You kind of, yeah. at this point, you're like, all right, I've spent all this time on, I'm going to try it. Let's see what happens. There it is. And it, I think it's very, very important that after queen e1, king h2, queen takes f2, there is the move bishop a3 check winning on c1. Maybe that is what Levy spent time trying to find. Without that move, there would have been no other effective discoveries, Robert. That's right. And the queen, you want to check bishop d2. That way you sort of avoid those discoveries as well. Once f7 falls, no matter what, black's in huge trouble. 
And I think Eric is going to take on F2 and go a piece down. A couple of accurate moves will still be required of Levy in that resulting position, but it's completely winning. And now five seconds for Eric as well. Yeah, I think Eric may be trying to regroup. Oh, queen D1. Okay. Just bishop D6 now. Queen takes F7. Yeah, and then bishop B5, as you were pointing out earlier. Because the thing about this position is, let's say you're bishop A3 and trade bishops, white will be up a pawn, but black has the best pawn on the board. So this now creates checkmating for us. If you go bishop E5 right now, the queen has to go all the way back to G6. You take D5, okay. you're up two pawns with the attack. And now you combine pressure against G7 with an attack on B4. Black's queen is essentially permanently tied down to the king side. I think it's probably time to start pushing her own passer. And Levy says it absolutely isn't. What? Bishop takes c3? Yeah, Eric wants queen d6, queen takes d5 in the end, but he's just two pawns down there. That's completely winning. Right. So Levy just making sure that it Although, is, in fact, winning. I've seen these positions get messed up. There's stalemate ideas. There's perpetuals. It's never over in these types of queen endgames. You have to be a little bit careful. The good news queen is Levy two. can just put his... Oh, I was going to put his queen behind the pass pawn and then just push it. How much do you Ooh. want to bet Eric is going to try to set up some sort of a stalemate? Yeah, no, you don't need to put wages. And of course he is. Right, h4, and you can see it here. He's trying to trade pawns. And if g4, his pawns are locked up. <laughs> and Levy realizes that. Levy's like, how do I avoid that scenario? And that's um, a good way to... Just queen takes g5. There's no stalemate with... There's on the king of some space. Eric's going to try to get his queen to g6. Oh, absolutely. Not that that does anything. You don't have to react to that. Or if a queen trade is offered in f7, he'll like go king h8 instead of taking back on f7. Absolutely. That's the, and that's, that's something, the Eric Rosen specialty. <laughs> that's something queen I'm sure five. Queen f5, king h8. Scouting report, king h8. Yeah, that's <laughs> what he's going to do. Yep, queen g6 coming. That's hilarious. But queen g4, and now... Gosh, Levy is struggling with this. He's down to 13 seconds. Queen g6, oh, and queen king, g6 h8. king h8. King h8. <laughs> I love this. This is amazing defense. H6. Levy just has to ignore this. He's overthinking it. Yeah, he's nervous of the reputation. He understands that there's these constant stalemate ideas. Queen F6, and now there's no stalemate. That's really nicely done. Take on F7, and that's that. Look at Levy. Oh. <laughs> Levy's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, he knows. He knows who he's up against. It's amazing when you're so happy that you convert a position where you're up three pawns. You're like, obviously, way too strong of a player that you shouldn't convert it, but he knows how resourceful Eric is. It's like Eric has studied all the tricks of the trade to survive completely lost positions and create a stalemate. And Eric really, yeah, he really pioneered that particular sub-segment of defensive play. I mean, he will find a way to set up a stalemate absolutely anywhere. And when you're playing him, you're starting to psych yourself out. You're seeing stalemates even when he's got five pawns remaining on the board. <laughs> <laughs> but we knew it was coming, and Levy knew it was oh, yeah. coming. So that was a, a good effort from Eric, but he does trail two to one. So Levy, he's playing really well thus far in the match. This line served him well for a while. Things started to get a little iffy when he allowed Eric to go C4 and eventually pawn to D5 and create a passer. But the start of the game, I think, here is nice for Levy. And in this position, I think Eric played queen b3. This time he deviates with bishop f4. And Levy putting together exactly the same setup. Knight on d5, bishop probably coming to e6. And it is incredibly solid for black. No question about it. Right. You know, for the double pawns, you have good control of squares. Like usually you have to bishop e6. Knight g5 has to be considered. Of course, you don't have to worry about that with the pawn covering the squares. So queen d7 for black is easily available. Just don't play rook to b8. It's a move that people want to play. I need to protect my pawn. Maybe I'll play b5, but yeah. don't forget about that bishop chilling on g3. An exchange sacrifice, of course. <laughs> Nobody's ever blundered with rook a b8. That's the uh, mug that Eric was drinking out the other day. It's funny. Uh, one of my favorite chess authors, Grandmaster Jonathan Rosen from Scotland, he, he wrote an influential book on chess psychology called The Seven Deadly Chess Sins. Mm -hmm. and, and he talks about... I, he has a snappy name for this, like storytelling, where, and everybody's done this, where you blunder something outright. And then as the game is going, you know you're going to lose. You're already composing the line that you're going to tell your friends or your coach after the game about how you sacrificed and you're trying to figure out what you could plausibly have miscalculated. And I'm pretty sure, you know, everybody has done this kind of thing. Or oh, you yeah. even try to tell, tell yourself this story. Well, that's why Eric has that, that little mug he was drinking out of. It says, treat every blunder as a gambit. Right. 
there's no story that needs to be told. They're just one sentence, got it. And what's happening here in one sentence? Well, I didn't think we need much more than one sentence to figure it out. So rookie two, there will be a doubling on the e-file, but what does that accomplish? And Levy plays bishop d6. That looks like you blundered a pawn, or excuse me, you gambited a pawn because yeah, the queen gets trapped over there on b7 after rook to b8. And how about gambiting the queen with queen takes a8 <laughs> or full compensation? You know, it's a lovely sacrifice. Minus seven. <laughs> no, nah, that's not a big deal. Let's go it's for okay. It. Minus seven here and there. What? Miguel Tall number one games where he was minus seven? Come on. <laughs> Certainly did, but I have to say, I feel like Levy has had the better first four games this far. I know we're still in the middle of game four here, but I feel like Levy just understands these Terracons extremely well, and Eric is struggling a bit to find dents in this opening. And also to your point, I mean, this is a slightly more controversial remark, but I think Levy is also up a point in the match. (laughs) (laughs) Although the match score doesn't always indicate who's been playing better you know if someone's oh, losing all game and then there's a mouse slip or something but no you, you're here it is completely true and now b5 is on the agenda it's and d- done it not what, yet though what about bishop takes d5 i've been wondering about that because black can't take back with the bishop as there's a pin along the e-file that would have forced black to give himself an isolated pawn on d5 yeah you know i think whether you would have gone for that would have depended on the position of your knight if you could have guaranteed that the knight reaches b5 efficiently, I would have absolutely gone for this. And in fact, maybe you want to go to b5, knight d2, knight b1, knight a3. But black might be able to squeeze in b5 and get pressure down the b file. Uh, right. But you don't want to go b5 here precisely because of that idea. If you recapture, you gambit the rook on e8 or the <laughs> knight on d5, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, who needs that rook anyway? So yeah. you, problems here for... Ooh, okay, so... Uh, really tempted very committal, to take on d5. Very committal. It's just going to be a big pawn on e6, right? You just leave that bishop there, try to work your knight around. But as you're saying, there's not really a point that the knight gets to that you feel thrilled about. He does go for it. It makes perfect sense to me. I've been advocating for it. But that knight on d2, it, even if it gets the b5, there's bishop to d7 always. That's true. But I think the trade of knight for bishop would be quite good for white, especially because he's got better control of the e-file. And in a uh, heavy piece end game, you could understand how these weaknesses might cause uh, a lot of anguish for black, especially if a rook lands on e5. F6 by Levy, preventing that exact idea, but creating more weaknesses. Yeah, the king is probably going to go to f7 at some point. And it's important to note that the b7 pawn is loose. So rook trades on the e-file, that may sound good from Levy's perspective, but b7 would be hanging and... All right, queen to b5, now making sure that the bishop can't move. It's infuriating. You know, white's pressed all the right buttons. He's made all the right noises. And yet, Eric hasn't gone even close to infiltrating and making actual progress here, especially after king f7. Now bishop d7 is something that white has to reckon with, chasing the queen away from its outpost. Right, so the queen can keep going into a6, but let's not forget about that a4 pawn. It's easy to keep your eyes off of that pawn. It's just been hanging out there for a while, but bishop d7 does threaten to win the pawn over there. And Eric continues to dance around with his knight. Knight f1. As he brings the queen back. Oh, rook, queen. Takes, rook takes e2 and b5. Uh-oh. And all of a sudden, there's problems down the b file. Right. And if you take on b5, bishop takes b5. Unbelievable. Black you're losing wins. material. Yeah. Because the queen defends the rook on b8. That is a critical detail. Here, black can simply take on f1. And it looks like it shouldn't be possible with the king out on f7, right. but there's no checks, nothing yes. like that. <laughs> and he finds it. Oh, gosh, this is not looking good for Eric. It is looking good on the clock, but besides that, this is looking problematic. He's had a problem in both games that have reached, that have uh, featured this opening to find a safe haven for his knight, to find any role for his knight. And Levy has completely turned the tables here. Not that the tables were ever really turned in Eric's favor, but you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. And knight e3, I think we know what white would be heading for after that move, just trying to avoid these a, b5 and all these tactics, and the d5 pawn is hanging. So I could actually see black making a move here and the advantage completely disappearing. So if you play b takes a4, this needs to be evaluated very carefully. Queen d5, queen d5, knight d5. This pawn on b2 is incredibly worrisome, right? Despite the optical... uh, you know, unpleasantness of Black's pawn structure. Maybe you just go bishop e6 and bishop c4. This might be the way to go. Right. 
but it looks bad because you've double isolated pawns there that aren't passed. But it makes sense because you'll also be able to play rook b3, pawn a3, and then <laughs> give yourself a passed a pawn. We're on exactly the same page, but Levy is not on the same page. Bishop c6, of course, is decent, but I think the end game was definitely more promising for black. And that's what I was now saying. Now I can take. The advantage is going away, and all of a sudden I like white's position because whose king is safer? The king on g1. Whose pawn structure is better? Clearly white's who only has two pawn islands. Black now has an isolated a pawn, an isolated d pawn, and as you're indicating, if rook takes b5, queen a2, watch out for pawn to c4. While f4 Whoa. was a... That's a big move. That's a clutch intermezzo because yet again the knight is a problem finding a good square. There is potentially the possibility of ruining white's kingside structure with f3. I'm... I might start with queen a2 here because you take my knight, I take your bishop. I'm perfectly happy to make that trade. And he goes knight g4 first. I was worried that bishop takes b5, but I guess the rook can just move. And h5, the knight goes back to h2 and around to f3 somehow. But at least there are no problems with the discovery. At least yeah. with the knight on h2, you know for a fact that black is going to have no way to target that knight. That's right. So it's an awkward knight, but it it's just going to hang out over there. But yeah, I don't know. Something about this, Donny, the trajectory feels like it might start heading in White's favor, the clock. The clock. The king I mean, safety. The clock is a problem yet again. As the pawn structure. Down to 40 seconds. Every element is starting to favor Eric in this game. Agreed. I, I agree completely. A4 by Levy. He continues to try to expand on the queen side, but the queen can park on A2, and there's no bishop C4 because you drop A4, and the queen infiltrates to E8. Yikes. If you take on b2, of course. And even just finding a move here, bishop d7, okay, retreating, that looks fine. I think black might play g5 at some point, but that also creates problems. Imagine the queen coming back to b1 and then eyeing the h7 square. And that's exactly what might happen. Although, what is your follow-up to a move like king g7? My knight can't get in. I wish it could, but sadly, it's not going anywhere. So I'm with you. Queen b1 is a one-move threat. Let's not forget that black still has ideas on the queen side. a3 will potentially happen if you pick put your queen on b1 in another set of circumstances queen b6 targeting b2 and black would love a queen trade so if levy can get the queens off the board he will be in charge so two moves that come to my knight to d2 please allow me to go knight e4 okay not anymore uh and yeah queen b1 was the other but now a3 feels worrisome even though you can just push forward to b4 as a response yeah but man that pass pawn on a3 supported by a rook from a8 yeah not would idea. get really scary so Eric thinking here, he's probably thinking, do I push h4 at some moment? Not right now because you're pinned on the b file and black can just play g4 first and then play a3. But at some moment, h4 is going to catch you off guard if you're levy and you only have 25 seconds. But Eric himself only is 35. And this is kind of like what happened in the first game where levy started to catch up on the clock and eventually Eric just sort of panicked. It's a much safer position for white than in that first game, but... Now a rook trade is on the horizon, and Levy's position continues to get easier and easier to play. Although if that knight gets from f3 to square like c5, it's not going to be pleasant for Levy. So you be very careful. And yes, step he one, he's fortunate knight d3 is met by bishop b5. But if this queen moves, you know knight d3 is coming. Uh oh, I and it's don't easy to miss like queen e7. Move. Very oh. committal move. Yeah, like hg and the queen to d2, and then knight d3 is coming. It just feels like. Even then I can go to C2 and to B4. Like, there are other avenues, and that's the problem with the bishop against a knight. Oh, now bishop B5 is no longer possible because oh. you drop this pawn with check, and the knight oh. is going to get to C5. No, and is... Eric is making big progress. And you can't go protect the A6 pawn with queen C6, One queen second. E7. Queen E7? Oh, but king G6. Queen F8? Oh, no, my F. gosh. Queen F8, is there an actual threat, though? Can you play queen B5? Queen, and G... B2? queen G8 takes D5? Oh, and the bishop hangs. Yes, take d5 oh, right now. Oh, and it starts to fall apart, oh. but he goes queen f7, and he worms his way in. Well, and queen to take f4. Oh, gosh, f4 hangs with check. No, that's that's too many pawns. But it's still not over. I mean, Levy has a check on e1, and it's now Oh, don't put the queen there. Queen e5. Oh, gosh. Oh, and it's, it's completely winning. King h2, king g3. Yeah, or this. Just, you know, put all your pawns in dark squares. The bishop can't do a single thing. Oh, and, and the knight prevails in the end. What an epic battle of minor pieces. Hey, you know, I was worried about this from the start, right? The knight could just reroute, and it, Eric did a perfect job. He timed it excellently in G4. Second time Levy has lost a game that was hovering around equality based on the eval bar where he threw pawns forward, yes. and he came to regret it. I, it's exactly what I was going to say. It was the second time he made a pawn move. 
the moment he thought he was safe, he overpressed and exquisite play by Eric, recognizing the importance of persistently trying to activate his knight. He kept trying until he succeeded. And I'm about to jinx it by saying this, but through the first four games, we haven't seen a position go from about even to like minus eight, except in time scrambles, right? Sometimes right. in these speed chess formats, this is just a huge blunder early on. These have been hard fought games that have come down to the wire. And we only are four games in, still so much of this match to go, and there's so much to look forward to. Indeed, and something tells me that we're going to see a completely different narrative and storyline in the three-minute segment, but that remains to be seen. We still have 25 more minutes of 5 plus 1 remaining and another positional line by Lemmy. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, but this is a clever because most people say, let me give you those double pawns, but after E takes F4... Give me that E5 square. Give me the E file, and maybe I'll play F5 if you're not looking out for it. So that could turn this game into something where it's from positional into giving White some tactical possibilities. Yeah, I don't like to give White that square. Now, White can still put a knight on E5 here, but that's not quite as imposing of an outpost as it would be if there would be a pawn on F4. Right, and the bishop is in the way. So if you're going to get that pawn to F4 stonewall style, you'll move your bishop back, then play F4. It's time-consuming, even if it is still a good idea. I wonder what stands behind Levy's decision in the early going of this match to get these very, very quiet, you know, positional grinds. It's an interesting decision. Good thing we have an interview after the match. So we I can... know, I was going <laughs> to say, if only we could ask him about it later. <laughs> so it's just, look at this position, right? The E pawn for the C pawn. That's the main difference here. And we know of the pawn minority attack. We play A3, B4 in this Carlsbad structure and try to strike with B5. But we saw what Eric did the last time. When A3 happened, he played A5 saying, no, 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 you're not going to put pressure on my queen side. In fact, he threw his pawn all the way up to A4 and that started to look pleasant. And his immediate idea here is to drop the knight back to d7, essentially just smoking the knight out of e5. And without that knight, white's position just lacks teeth. Maybe queen b3 should have been considered. Is he going to bishop g5 now just to... Okay, queen f3, reasonable. Yeah, but now takes and maybe knight c8, knight d6, that idea from the previous queen's gambit decline game could be considered. I like it. The one thing about this pawn structure for black that could be dangerous is if that knight on c3 were on f3 and you could play knight g5, queen h4 and True. start threatening the black king, but the knight is on c3, not on the other side of the board, so there's no issues for Eric's king. Yeah, and I agree with you that a3, b4, it just sort of lacks luster in this particular position, a5 and you know, congratulations, what do you do now? <laughs> you and played a3, what now? It can come to backfire because when black was a4, and eventually tries to play b5, you can never play pawn b2 to b3 to keep the knight out of c4. So you've committed to a pawn structure over here on the queen side, and that allows that knight to just happily jump forward. And Levy, that's a very committal pawn move. He's made a lot of those, and some of them have backfired. He is not hiding his intentions here. He wants to expand in the center with e4. And that move would be better if the c rook was on e1, right? Because if the rook was an f1 and you played e4 and the f file opens, you're happy to have a rook on f1 and e1. Now the rook's on c1, staring into kind of all of nothing. So rook d8 played by Eric. Please do it. Play e4. You're not going to have a problem with your d4 pawn, not at all. Zero. No problems with the king. No problems with the <laughs> f4 square. No, 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 no. And he plays g4. Mm -hmm. And is Levy starting a some sort of a pawn storm on the king side, which, of course, is very double-edged? And yes, he is. And the best way to combat a, a potential attack on the king side, we often think is just, let me put all my pieces over there and deal with the immediate threats. No, sometimes it's best to counter in the center or on the other flank to distract some of white's pieces. So a move like knight c4, either now or after playing b5 could be good. And actually now it still makes sense because after bishop c4, d takes c4, there is no pawn to e4 because d4 is loose. And as you put on knight d5 or pawn to c5, just hammering away at the middle of the board. Yeah, white's king is going to be unsafe for the rest of the game. And Eric is on exactly the same page. Excellent move, practically speaking. I like and it a lot. Levy could ignore because knight takes c3 isn't technically a threat. And the reason it's not a threat is because the knight could have dropped back to d1. But Levy continues to push his pawns, exploiting the overloaded nature of the pawn on d5. Interesting move. 
And if you know, Black had the pawn on b5 already, you could take on e4. So really right. nicely timed here by Levy. If Black plays b5, thinking next move you'll take on e4, White can keep pushing through to e5, and ooh, that could be a dangerous attack. That unravels really, really quickly for Black. Eric needs some sort of creative idea here. e5 is a very serious threat. e takes d5 is also something to consider because after Black takes twice on e1 and White plays king f2, the knight's going to hang, the rook's going to hang. What does Black even do? You're going like to create me. You're going to like my creative solution. Queen d7, because if you play e5, I'm oh, sacking my knight on g4. Look at you. You sack it on g4. You get two pawns there, another one on d4, and e5 is going to fall as well. This is out of the question for White. Well, you asked for a creative solution. You encouraged me. Thank you, partner. And now I'm finding ideas where you can just sacrifice a piece and steal all the material in return for it. And as you're pointing out, you might not even be down a piece for pawns. You might just get that piece right back. And after queen d7, now d takes e4 in addition to knight takes g4 as a threat because the d4 pawn was hanging with check. But he goes for b5, the original option. e takes d5 is now no longer dangerous, but e5, Robert, we were talking about it. e5 followed by f4. That gets really, really dangerous if Black can't strike in a timely fashion with c5. Right. The good news is, you know, that it's not immediately checkmate. And I would say one more thing is that queen can go over to a7 at the right moment. And the queen for white will likely have to slide to f2. So it's not just about a checkmating attack. e5 is so good because e3 was a pawn that could be targeted, whereas a protected pawn e5 just takes space and controls a lot of squares. So I think that Levy should push that pawn e5. Both players hovering around two minutes, Danya, we're likely heading towards a time scramble, and it's not clear exactly how to proceed. This is going to be a doozy for sure because there's so many important decisions to be made in the next 5-10 moves. And after e5, Black, as you were indicating, can respond to the immediate queen a7, but he does take on d5. I kind of ruled that out in my mind because the knight is now protected. I guess what Levy is saying is that after you take on e1 and the king moves to f2, c6 is going to hang. And apparently this is really bad for Black. Wow, I guess queen a7 was the move that had to be played. I was looking at this uh -huh. and assuming that this was going to be acceptable because you had two rooks for the queen right. and the king's out in f2. But d takes c6. I had this uh, chess notebook growing up that said happiness is a pass pawn. And a pawn on c6 in this position, that is pure bliss. And guess what? You like to point this out. That pawn on f3 is a sort of unsung hero of White's position because it is completely taking this knight out of commission. There's no forks. There's no checks. That knight is just sort of sitting idly by. And after dc knight b2, this game is still far, far from being over. And rook takes d4 would be coming as well. So that's a smart decision by Levy to take on c4 first. And now for dc6, rook takes d4. First of all, the b2 pawn is lost. But also, you're noticing that rook d2 check will be a nasty skewer along the second rank. So the queen from h2 will have to run away after rook takes d4. But the king has the escape score g3. And on g3, it is perfectly safe, surrounded by a cocoon of pawns with the knight once again totally ineffective. I love the way Levy is playing this. Queen c7 is an excellent move. Yeah, this game has been uh, really nicely played by Levy, as you're saying. And uh, queen takes e1, How that just looks so correct. And yet Levy had properly assessed it in a way that Eric had not. Still plenty of life left. That king on g3, it's safe for now, but you make one mistake, you overlook a threat, and rookie one to g1, and that king could be under fire. And if you're Eric, you need to take on b2, maybe park your rook on b3, and at least create some source of counterplay. Unquestionably, Levy is winning here, but accurate technique is still required. Right, and if you let those rooks team up against that yeah. one pawn on c6, it's isolated. So rooks can be really good at, you know, put one on c8, one e6, and if you're not careful, that pawn may not be long for this board. No. And should white take on a5 and support the knight? Or should White try to focus his energies on promoting quickly? I guess your point is rook b3 is kind of an annoying yes. move. But now there's queen takes c4. Oh, that's an excellent catch by Levy. And Eric missed it. Queen takes c4 is a very easy move to miss because it simultaneously protects the knight. Now you have to take on a3. But then in comes White's pawn. Yeah, and then rook c8 is forced. Knight and b5. And there's no knight e4 check or anything like that. So yeah, the knight is just walking in and... That should be that. And the story of this endgame is just how safe White's king is. Levy didn't have to spend an ounce of energy worrying about the safety of his king. He could divert all of his resources on promoting this pawn. Yeah, no, it's they're all perfectly placed there. And okay, so c7 now was there rook c8, knight b5. There might be knight e8. So 
Eric okay. is doing a great job of holding. If he could sacrifice his rook for the knight and the pawn, he has chances to survive this game. So that's what he's going for. Like, even knight b5, I guess it doesn't work here. Rook takes b5, queen takes his queen b8 check at the end. But oh. if you were able to sacrifice in that manner, you'd still leave yourself with a chance. But don't take on a4 because then black plays rook b7 and win c7. Right. And at that point, white's not even worse. He goes knight b5. 98. Another precise move by Levy. Go 98. Only move. Queen takes a4, rook takes b5, queen takes b5. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. black is going to lose that knight as well. But if you get queen and three pawns against rook and three pawns, there's still some chances because you might walk into a fortress by mistake. And it won't be an area game without at least one stalemate attempt, so... How is he going to set this up? Back to d4, goes the queen. This rook, rook is not long for this board. No, but rook e7, and then you're going to have to sack on c7. I think you have no Oh, choice. don't go queen d8, because rook e takes c7. Oh. So precise by Levy. And can he finish it off? Queen can c6 just, and queen b7. That looks good. He can also start pushing that a pawn, but then the c7 pawn is hanging, although then black's all tied up. But he finds queen b7, or will he? Five seconds. Okay, but he's a4, knight, knight c7. And, and, and now he's just going to push. Yeah, this black's... No, he moved the rook. Knight c7. Oh, oh knight d6 that was yeah. so accurate yeah knight takes c8 and queen b7 and okay rook eight. Oh, you don't get the a5 pawns i know this is nope. easy for us but he's gonna give up his pawns you know what's going on you know what's <laughs> happening you know exactly what eric is aiming for <laughs> rook g7 uh, queen h6 checkmate is good oh enough. oh, look oh at my that. god that was an amazing game by levy yeah that was superb right once he got e4 in and the position started to turn around. He didn't let it go for a second. And he saw all the tactics, right? We were talking about queen d8, but Eric had that rook takes e7 move. Levy's like, I got this, fellas. I got this under control. And I couldn't tell, but was he, you know, you know kind of tell himself to calm down? He kind of did that LeBron James post dunk, you know, like, you know, one of those. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I think we've seen this one before. So we were seeing the, the Gurganidzi and the positional lines. That's our opening themes of the day yeah and i really wonder if those opening themes are going to persist or change in a three-minute portion the evolve are disliking knight b6 and i think it might have something to do with the potential exchange sacrifice on e6 i'm not sure though mm, that could it, be fun. it could also just be c4 like the same idea we saw in that their first game in this line bishop d3 bishop b6 c4 and robert initially i didn't like black's position there with all those d5 threats right I and would... i don't like the fact that levy is repeating this uh, we do have Ooh. to remember that the players you know, no longer get the midway break. To, after the five-minute portion, I'm positive both of them will look at this line. Like, like, okay, this is working out for me until I go for this bishop e6 allowing c4 thing. And Eric's like, oh, I don't really love this altogether. Let me maybe play d4 and move one. I could see that right. happening in the short time control. However, I do think Levy just it feels more comfortable in the Karakhan. No matter if he's playing every move perfectly, I just I like the way he's handling these positions. He just needs to avoid that time trouble. Yeah, he absolutely does. And yet again, the story of this position is the knight on d2, can it find a safe haven? You definitely don't want to go knight e4 due to f5. Although actually, you might be able to get away with it. f5, there's bishop g5. Oh, Look at this line. Nice. And you might say, oh, f6, and both of the minor pieces are hanging. But whoop, knight takes f6 check. That was not a very passionate whoop, but it's also <laughs> a pretty simple tactic. And white emerges up upon. Yeah, no, that, that was a clever little sequence there. And it's especially good for Bullet, right? Because then someone's to really tell me, ah, you blundered your piece. And you're like, aha, gotcha. Thanks for the pawn. So this exactly. queen went to b3, then back to c2, and now back to d1. That isn't inspiring. And yet the eval bar says no problems whatsoever for white because black doesn't have any breakthroughs, right? When you're spending a lot of time, that could be controversial and just bad if your opponent can take advantage easily. Black doesn't have a C5, doesn't have anything to sort of attack white. So even though Eric is dilly-dallying, it hasn't cost him, at least not at, to this point. Well, it's cost him a little bit on the clock, and it just doesn't seem to me that he's all that comfortable in these positions and very committal. How does he defend D4 while keeping C4 protected? That's a fantastic question that I don't have an answer to. Um... I don't think he's got an answer to it either. Ooh, 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 give me that square, says Levy. Yeah, that can't be good. Like, at all. And how are you going to protect the pawn anyway? So if you go, he was knight d5, but I was thinking if you go knight back and then bishop d5, feels like you're just going to remove the guard of that pawn at some point. 
Well, I wouldn't have been able to resist the temptation to put a knight on d5, though. Yeah, that knight's going to b4 or f4, if you <laughs> allow me to. This is like an absolute dream position out of this line. That's terrible for white. You know, Eric was doing nothing, and then he did something, and then he regretted doing something. Like, can I please put that pawn back on c3 now? Right, that would have changed everything. And now he might... Still put a bishop on d5. Levy just has to figure out the order of operations here. Rook d8 first. I like it. Gosh. Being saddled with the backwards pawns on the worst feeling. This is the worst. No, this, right? this is just terrible. You know, moving apartments, that stinks. Friends running late and not having a good excuse, that stinks. Backwards pawns. <sighs> right. Getting a restaurant recommendation five times and then the restaurant turning out to be terrible. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this position is just, there's no plan for white. You know what your plan is? Protect the D4 pawn. At some point, you might just give it up just to get some activity. But look at all of Levy's pieces. A knight entrenched on B4. A bishop just salivating at its prospects on D5. Bishop at home, hanging out on G7, saying, don't forget about me. I'm slicing forward towards your center. So, yeah, this just looks miserable for white, who controls nothing and has a weak pawn. Hey, but speaking of plans, as Snoop Dogg says in a recent commercial, as he takes Andy Samberg's phone and puts it in the ice bucket, the best plans are no plans. And it's not Snoop Dogg, it's Snoop D-O-double-G. D-O-double-G. Mm -hmm. Got it. G. M making a note of that. That exact commercial. He's like, just call me Snoop. And he's like, okay, Snoop, D-O-double-G. I'm just, I'm more impressed that you know the exact commercial I'm talking about. Yeah, come on. I watch playoff basketball. That okay, commercial is overplayed. I agree. But the best plans for black involve going knight c2 and tearing white's entire center apart. Oof. Which Eric tries to prevent with rook c1. But he just can't cover all of the entrances and exits here. It's just there's too many inroads, too many weaknesses. And Levy just has to find the right time to strike. Robert, that's a familiar problem, a problem that Eric didn't successfully manage in game one. Can Levy do a better job here? I, I feel like Levy's probably frustrated by this position. And I get it because it looks so good for black in every way but then winning converting this advantage into a full point when your opponent is finding ideas like eric just did bishop g5 you definitely don't want to play f6 do you really want to play rook d7 and then maybe the white rook will slide to e1 and then white takes over the e file so you know as much as we've been criticizing this d4 pawn and how this position looks it really is not easy to convert for levy yeah and look at the last few moves bishop b6 to d5 then he went to e4 he went back to d5 and Eric is the one making progress. He's going to get a rook to e1. And don't laugh, but before you know it, it might actually be white who's starting to play for an advantage down this e-file. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's why... Uh-oh. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait, wait. Was there like a bishop, bishop d8, e8, bishop e2, yeah. bishop a5? Yes, there was. And if the knight moves back, you go rook e1 with a pin. If the knight goes to d3, you go up to c2, and black can't hold both of these miners at the same time. This was winning for white. So that's difficult to visualize when you're moving quickly, but Eric had two minutes on his clock, so he should have thought about it. That's He absolutely, I mean, he definitely saw that this was possible. You gotta calculate it. Gotta yeah. Gotta calculate this stuff. And now he's completely lost. He just dropped d4, and he's dropping the game. So that's, uh, I don't know what that's a product of, because Eric has been ahead on the clock for most of this match. And he could have spent 30 seconds there. At least calculate it, right? You don't rush these decisions. But rook d3 is apparently inaccurate, and that gives white's queen a new lease on life. Queen b8 now a big threat. So it's not quite over just yet. Oh, there's Maybe probably queen some e8. kind of f6, knight d3 stuff, or f4, knight d3 stuff there, because the rook and on c1 would have been hanging. But either way, still looks good for black, but levy a little bit behind on the clock. He has been playing well in the time scrambles, but I don't think... His heart is enjoying it so much. Right, and the rook has no access to d1. He plays f6. Never played that move. Nope, especially because Ben Feingold is actually in the chat. Oh, he is? Which is well, you he asking was me, as of I, like 15 minutes ago. You know I don't read the chat. Should I open chat just to see if Ben's still there? Um, I think you kind of do have better things to do with your life, but hey, if you wish, <laughs> I won't stop you. A queen trade, and the bishop is going to try to swing over to c7 or d6. No, it's not. <laughs> I like that idea. Knight d3 didn't work because of rook to d1. Exactly. But even this endgame, it's what we talk about as soon as we see the double pawns. 
is Black really up a pawn? Yes, if we count one by one, there are seven of them. But if the rooks get traded, which you want to do when ahead material from the Black side of things, that might be bad for Black because you're not really up a pawn and your queenside pawns, while safe for now, maybe the bishop can go into c7, like you mentioned. Yeah, that's a constant problem. And the, the knight is sort of a paper tiger. It looks really nice. In the middle game, it was causing a lot more damage than it is in the end game. And Levy brings it back to d5. It can be pinned with the bishop from c4. Rook d1 might allow knight takes c3. I'm not sure what to make of that resulting position. I like the look of it. You get the minor pieces, c5 or b2 will drop. So right. rook d1, one of those things. Ah, you can't take me. And then your opponent takes you. You're like, oh, ah. You know what's not out of the question here is taking on d5 and then going like rook c4 and b4. Just trying to liquidate as much as possible. Yeah, the bishop d4 apparently... Is there like a knight b6 almost? I want to play knight b6. Oh my god, knight b6? Yeah. So you're forcing me, I assume, to take... Oh, and this is just really, really bad for white because the rook is coming to d2 and I'm going to pick up that b6 pawn. Amazing right. idea. Yeah, it's hard to make that move because opposite colored bishops does not sound like something you want, but that was in fact the move. So knight b4, reasonable, but knight b6. And you played it. Yeah, four rather than a six, who cares? Same thing. <laughs> Watch out for oh. bishop takes f6. Yeah, Very exactly. Good. Oh, bishop takes c5, you're pinned. Bishop takes f6, discovery. Yeah, what now? It's a double-sided coin. Rookie one does exit the freeway of death, but then there's knight c2 related problems. Oh, king oh, of rook d4? Oh, and then king of fate and then king e8. Yeah, and your bishop is stuck to the rook. The bishop doesn't have a lot of real estate on that diagonal. That's nice. He, he doesn't do it, knight though. C2. Now bishop h6 is another Oh, idea. knight c2 is but bishop h6? It's not the end of the world. You go king e8, but it can uh, get really scary. So he goes g... I like g5 because you're throwing... Shuts down the bishop. And knight c2. Now knight c2, take e3, take c5. But then still, still not changed. totally over. I'm with you. Especially because a rook trade is probably fine for white, even though he will be down two pawns because of the damaged pawn structure and the inability to create a passer. Is there a rook the d1? Side. If rook e2, is there rook d1, knight e1, knight f3, and a checkmate? Oh, and like G4 there? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Entirely possible. What is Le Eric thinking about? You've got to go rookie two. Yeah, because he's probably looking at his checkmate. Okay, Levy wasn't even thinking about it. But rook D191 is what I would have gone for. Rook D3. And now you go rook D3 and get it to D7 because the rook trade, that's what you got to notice. The rook trade is fine for white. Ah, and he Eric's doesn't play it. He still has chances. I know it just went down to minus 3.6 or whatever, but he definitely still has chance opposite color bishops and no time for other side. He has very serious chances. It's easy to blunder, but Levy preparing b5 is going to try to create a passer oh, on the king side. that wins a pawn. A pawn is one, though. f5 or h7. Give me one of yes, those. Yes, it is. Both on light squares. Both are skewered. So take b5, take f5. Take f5. King f3, g4, h5 is not out of the question. Yeah, before you know it, White might be playing for a win. He kind of pinned himself, and now here e comes the king. Okay, king e4 would have probably just made it a draw. Levy oh. has to find a way to keep pushing his pawns. But here comes Eric's king. Two <laughs> seconds for Levy. His, I think not, he's going to win, though. Not only am I like looking at the king as an attacking piece, I'm looking for stalemate with the king on h1. Oh, but now the pawn is never getting to b1. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Rook e6 check. The king couldn't go to d7. The good thing for black is that the pawn is permanently defended by the bishop, but Eric can now create a second passer on the h file. Oh, my goodness. If that, oh, bishop g3. Oh, bishop g3. Never That's mind. not a pawn you want to give up. And now he's going to have a hard time creating a passer. Okay, but thankfully for... Uh, oh, B2 was oh, hanging hang free! B2 was just, it was just free! Oh, but that the H1. one Take the G pawn. Oh, G6. He's falling apart. Oh, my gosh. Then coming to F7? And the thing about this is, even if you win A3, you have Bishop The Rook is hanging! It's been hanging! It was hanging! Oh, another Bishop B4! Oh, my God! Queen. Four. He's going to win! G7. Is, White's going to make a Queen, too. But, but it's lost. It, King got a Queen E7? Queen E7! Oh, Still oh my rook god, rook g2. No stalemates. What a heartbreaker. The rook was hanging on g2. Has <sighs> some space. I thought it was going to be a stalemate for a second. Oh! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you left the rook on the g file, that was stalemate. Well, the increment is the increment is a savior in these cases. Oh my god. What a ridiculous finale. That was absurd. And I was just saying how you can give up the A pawn, just push your pawn to still win. And he pinned himself on the E file. And then it, it got blocked on the B file, and Levy got a queen. Yeah, two different pieces that were very safely guarding the B1 square, and he found a way 
to immobilize both of them. <laughs> yeah, he pushes F pawn. <laughs> See, that it's, has been a trend today. People pushing certain pawns when they have no business doing so. But that rook hanging, I mean, you can totally understand it because they were having, they had two seconds for like the last four years. <laughs> so right. at that point, they were just, I need to make a move mode. Yeah, no, and everyone's having the time of their lives watching. Uh, their lives are probably getting shorter by the stress <laughs> of this match. Oh, and absolutely. Once the hair more, is getting grayer. we are getting the good old positional line here in the Queen's Gambit decline. Wait, what? What was available to white there? Was there e4 or something? Was Why there a they... move? Let's see. It was what? apparently bishop g6 and then e4. Got it. Because the bar went pretty high considering... Well, black is undeveloped. That's true. The, the, you know, the pressure down the e-file, the king is a little bit weak. But anyways, levy in full positional line mode. Okay. Oh, right, here we go with this again. Yeah, can we he get a new opening? This idea. I think we will get a new opening when we get to the three plus one. But at least... It's a new position. We got a capture on F4. We know a knight's coming into E5. But just like in the Gurganidze, those are long-term problems for white. That If the queens come off the board and we get some trades, black will be better in the end game. Right. There's that A4 move again. We've mm -hmm. seen that many times before. I wonder what he wants to do. Does he want to play B5, knight B6, knight C4? Probably. Or the immediate knight B6. But then I guess... The knight doesn't have further prospects. But you'll play knight b6, then you go rookie seven, knight e8, knight d6. And that sounds right. like it takes forever, but where is white's progress going to come from? Probably rook e3 and either rook to e1 or maybe rook g or h3. So you do have to watch out for a rook lift initiating the attack. And that was another good thing about the pawn taking on a four. It cleared the e3 square for uh, lift. Yeah, you absolutely shouldn't fall asleep on the prospect of a kingside attack. The rook gets to h3, and before you know it, that pawn's going to be shoved down to g5. So... This can get quite dangerous. I would definitely play rookie three. And then, depending on what black does, I would decide whether to play down the E file or to try to play on the king side. There is an argument to be made for the move knight E4 for black because you really want to kick that knight out of uh, E5 with the move like F6. I understand mm -hmm. the pawn sacrifice. It may not be fully justified, but with the D4 pawn stuck and isolated with those double F pawns, yeah, maybe this is reasonable. Yeah, rookie four, and then you can play F6, but okay, give you into five. I love right. how the, <laughs> the arrow, I, you know, whenever that happens. That rookie to d5 actually looked really good there. Right. <laughs> Not bad at all. <laughs> but he and right back to c8. Knight. Oh, the a4 pawn. I was like, why queen c2? Why not just double on the e file and bring your rook <laughs> over? Ah, that little a4 pawn. And that little a4 pawn is defended by the queen. Now rook a e1 is, knight d6 is likely. Is there knight d7 here? Oh, my God. Look at you. 97 because you're you're gonna cripple black kingside pawn structure yeah. and how bad that is is unclear but it's definitely not good for black that's for sure well i mean it, it definitely was missed by eric but it's fortunate that this is point two i think from a blitz perspective it's way more of an advantage for white because king safety is so important in blitz uh but with a five minute start now both players have plenty of time he will be able to kind of gather his bearings and realize, oh, it's okay. Double isolated pawns in front of my king. Exposed G-file, not checkmate. But like you're saying, the shock value of these kinds of moves and blitz make them incredibly dangerous. Yeah. And I just noticed that the rooks aren't connected. The only piece defending is knight on f6. So let me distract your knight away. Levy is searching. He's looking. The stock move is rook a e1. But I think he senses he's got this small window of opportunity. The moment Black gets the knight out of c8, the rooks are connected. The tactical potential of White's position diminishes greatly. Oh, and White could just be worse in a few moves, right? You get the knight Absolutely. to b6. Uh, you can even think of a g6 knight to f5, things like that. The d4 pawn being isolated is a problem. Uh, the f4 pawn not helping you in any sort of attack. So I'm um, looking at this position, and now is the time to strike. And he goes uh, with the e1, just doesn't, doesn't play it. quite see it. And the ship sails. Eric is going to happily play knight d6. By the way, oh, no, 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 I hallucinated. For a second, I thought you still had knight d7. Then I realized the, the rook is too well protected. Yeah, with a knight on d6 protecting that rook, that would be a really bad blunder where you're like, I saw knight d7 the first time, but it looked better the second time where right. I could trade a pair of rooks and get you know one of those defensive pieces away from your king, and then your opponent plays knight takes d7. And you're just like, basically. Uh, Small oversight. And how do you defend this for white? He goes rook h3, so he 
it, it seems that he's kind of been, you know, as, as they say in Russian, sitting on, trying to sit on two different chairs at the same time. You know, he's been playing in the center and now he switched to the king side, but he's given Black a little bit too much time, or has he? Don't take knight, knight takes e4. That's the for one sure. One thing don't, I can tell you for sure. Don't blunder your rook down there. That's good advice. Rook e2. Could have played rook e3 if he wanted to bring another rook over to the king side. So will Black now take on c3 and put the other knight on e4 with a knight toward eventually playing f6? No. No. <laughs> I was thinking <laughs> about it. And I got the answer for nope. you. Queen so d3? Is it queen b3 after queen d3? There's knight takes e4, you sneaky oh tactical guy. I totally saw both of those moves. <laughs> Well, you know, queen d3, queen a6, maybe. Go for the queen trade. It's a hard position to play for both sides. It's unclear what's happening. Right. And you can take on c3 right away. I mean, b takes c3, the a3 pawn will be loose. So if you take with the queen on c3, the next knight comes in the e4, like you were suggesting before. Hmm. But then white can play f3, so you get a battle of the f pawns. Ben's <laughs> yeah. favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ben, avert your eyes. Don't listen. Right. Go back to doing anything else but hearing about F3 and F6. Uh, he's in the chat. He's not looking at the board. <laughs> so I mean, you say it's a difficult position to play. I agree with you. So let's try to come up with moves right now. So knight takes C3 is one option. Queen A6, as you're pointing out. I mentioned queen B3, but I'm regretting it after knight takes E4. Uh, H6 or G6. Yeah, yeah, fix the problem of the H7 pawn and create some looks. That makes sense. H6 can just safely push the pawn forward never have to worry about any kind of checkmating attack over there right eric he's thinking and he does go with your queen a6 he spent a bunch of time he still has a lead on the clock though yeah and that's been kind of a theme in the initial part of the match but it really hasn't cost levy too much thus far now will he trade on a6 will he drop his queen back to c2 from a tactical perspective you want to keep the queens on the board otherwise what is your rook doing here but I don't see anything obvious or clear that white can do on the king side. Oh, queen c2 played. And knight takes c3. You can't take on c3 with the queen because your e2 rook drops. So you'd have to take with your pawn or your rook. I guess you take with the pawn. I wish that rook but, were on e3 rather than e2. But I wish the black pawn had been on h6 rather than h7. One line where that would have been uh, clutch is if white goes f3 here, you can't play knight takes e3, you drop h7 to check. But if the pawn had been on h6, this would have been very possible. Right, because the queen Not gets Not a distracted. big deal, but something to consider. Queen back to a7, we get a weird cat and mouse game and a repetition. What a repetition that would be, right? That's like high quality chess, zero is in the eval bar, and they understand that this is how we secure that half point. This is how Stockfish and Leela draw their <laughs> games in the, the computer championship. I like it. Okay, well, we see Eric play queen seven. He is ahead in the clock. His position looks pretty good, the foundation of it, but the tactical issues remain. So h6 right now, is there any drawback to that move? No. I would have seriously considered it. Queen b6 by Eric. So uh, he's a not... Ooh, I guess... A4 hangs, d4 hangs. Yeah. And this is the draw for Eric. Can play queen a6 with three-time repetition. He's down to a minute on the clock. So with every passing second the likelihood increases. Hmm. I guess what he shouldn't do is wait until he has 30 seconds, then play h6. And but there's queen b3, b3. your so move. Knight takes e4, there's no queen takes d3, because knight takes f6 is check. Watch out for that yes. intermezzo. But I guess after knight e4, he'll just take back with the knight. It's like, we'll trade queens on b3, you'll win my pawn, but I'll finally kick your knight out of that e5 square. And that rook on b3 is going to be very out of place. It's going to be susceptible to various tactics related to the back rank. Eric blundered this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like he's thinking now after knight takes e4. He just didn't realize that he's going to lose a pawn. And he embraces it. He gambits the pawn. There's so many tactics here, though. After, after rook takes b3, f6. f6, knight moves somewhere. If it goes like up to d7 or something, there was like knight c3 ideas and all sorts of back rank checkmates. But Eric choosing to play very positionally here. He drops the knight back. Now, f6 is now a huge threat. Right. And it... I mean, king f1, supporting the rook. Ooh. Now he hits d4. So knight f3 back just to defend? Yeah, I'm worried about the long-term prospects here oh. with rookie four. Wow. Please take Another me. Another rook comes in. g3, though. Yeah, g3, then f6, perhaps, just to create luft for okay. the king. That b7 pawn is so tilting. It's tying the knight down. 
Right, you would love to just go knight f5 and win b4. And but what does white do? Rookie three and king e2? You gotta get your king to the center. Rookie somehow. three invites knight f5 though. Oh, and the rook is hanging. Goes rook d3. Okay, you can never take any four. All of a sudden, Levy's got five seconds. Uh, here comes that rook to c1. No real threat though. It just feels annoying. Well, knight c4 is oh. sort of a threat. Knight c yeah, where does the rook go? Up to d3, and then you play b5. And then black rooks get to the second rank. Right. But he goes slowly. Knight C wait. Knight C4, there was everything was hanging there. Yeah, no, Knight C4 looked good, but okay. It still looks good. And now he's definitely ready to play Knight C4. Rook E2, can't blame Whoa. that. And, ooh, it's almost a 94, okay, Rook E1. Oh, 94 is coming. And yeah. F2 falls and B2 falls. This is over. Everything's fine. The 94 is stable there. And this looks just gunzo. Somehow Levy has avoided losing on time, but he's lost on the position. This has been amazing technique by Eric. Get back to e4. Don't you even think about moving the knight away. He, he wants to mate him. Yeah, he won h5 and knight h3 checkmate. And now he's going after g3. He could have started with h5. Whoa! Oh, oh, knight h5 mate! He made in one. Yeah, but this made is one. But he's won the exchange. He'll be okay with this position. I was just verifying that it was mate. <laughs> and, and look, oh, and the anywhere. table's turn now. Levy's the one trying to get stalemate. Yeah, you need the king on where? I don't even... Knight h8. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, he won a pawn! Passer <laughs> is taking Black's pawns! That was awesome. Knight h8, just uh, to throw it in there. And the best part about this is the match clock is zeros for this time yep. control. So it's not like you're wasting any time off the match clock to no. get this to the, quick, the quicker time patrols. And now he resigns. But 4-3 to three is your score. Look at Levy. I mean, he's he needs this break. Eric, I can't tell how he's feeling. Always looks kind of... I same listen i was expecting this to be a lot more tactical but i am not complaining let me be very clear the level of the games really every single game has been incredibly high i hit i think you hit the nail on the head when you said that none of the games have really been decided by a big blunder these have been long barn burner affairs and this is what we love to see from a matchup between these two titans and i wonder if we can get our stats team on the lookout to see what the average number of moves in these games. They feel very long, but regardless, it is a four to three lead for Levy Rosman. That is Gotham Chess. And it's time for the players to take a quick break. We will do the same and return to more from the I Am Not GM Speeches Championship brought to you by chess.com. This is going to be a real-time breakdown of Danny Wrench's games all time on chess.com. Uh, that's cool. Oh! In the last month, I am playing 83.12. Oh! Mm. I'm less accurate than them in every stage. Yeah. Man, that, that stings a little you bit. You should okay. do the more game review. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, so... <laughs> Tuesday sucks. I gotta stop playing chess on Tuesday. Oh, it's because it's title Tuesday! <laughs> Look how many blunders there were back in December 2020. And now December 2021, 1600. Don't look at this number. <laughs> look at look at this number. Best. Let's go to uh, tactics. Mates. <laughs> we'll probably need to work on these ones. Yep. Every single rook fork that has presented itself to me, I have found. No one has a higher percentage of rook forks than I do. That's correct. These are literally the knight forks that you missed. I missed, missed knight d6? It, you saw it just now. What the? 
is wrong with me? <laughs> I could have done here and then taken this pawn and I'm winning because my pawns get held together. That's probably the coolest part about this feature. Like these positions against Hess? <laughs> Rook there for Rook E2. And he blunders me in one. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm awful. B7 drops white is gonna be super fast. Queen B4. Wait, what? 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 That's a free queen. What? 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 What was that? The Women's Speed Chess Championship is back, featuring many of the top female players in the world. This is the most prominent online tournament for titled women players. And the second qualifier is tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific time. The $70,000 prize fund will be vied for by players like Ho Yifan and Polina Shuvalova, who won her match the I Am Not GM Speed Chess Championship yesterday. Speaking of the I Am Not GM Speed Chess Championship, that's where we are right here, right now. It is Levy Rosman. It is Eric Rosen. And you are Daniel, Daniel Nerdisky. And Danya, you look <laughs> at that prediction, smart chess, incorrect in the 5 plus 1 yeah. prediction. Your grandmaster Robert Hess, and uh, we were popping the champagne because all we need to hear are the words smarter chess and incorrect in the same sentence, right? And the Dom Perignon comes out.
<laughs> well, it's not coming out for Eric Rosen because he no. trails <laughs> four to three right now, despite those predictions. And the prediction included one more game than actually happened, right? Four and a half, three and a half in Eric's favor. But regardless, that means that we only have seven games played rather than the eight that was predicted. Those games went on for a long time. And listen, as the next game starts, when you're losing after a, a certain segment, I think it's worthwhile asking yourself, first of all, where is Levy Rosman? Okay, he finally makes a move. Second of all, am I doing anything systemically wrong? Am I losing games in the same fashion again and again? That's when you know you got to make a stylistic change. And for Eric, I don't really think the answer is yes. I think he's getting outplayed in some of these games, but he's playing good, solid chess. He's got to keep the same style and keep the same good time management. I think he'll be fine. And you know what's not fine? The opening that they played? That <laughs> is... Very far from fine. You're not a fan of the Gurganidzi system here in the Karakhan. It's a tried and true by Levy. And okay, we have a different position. Rook went to E1, now pawn to B5. So come on, Danya, appreciate the little things. Okay, well, at least, at least Levy played B5 this time. So we get a little bit of variety. And he sets up this very classic pawn chain such that the pawns control all of the key light scores. I like the positions that he's been getting out of the opening in the Gurganidze. Well, I'm wondering about D5 right now, because you were just talking about that pawn chain that looks nice and safe and sound. But after D5, I'm trying to remove the base of the chain, go after the B5 pawn, and start pawn hunting. Well, great minds think alike. Well, Eric, you know, he just sees a B5 pawn. He wants a B5 pawn. And if you play Bishop B7 or Bishop D7, thinking you're just defending after the trade on C6, as you're pointing out, Knight to D4, after Queen trade even, the problem persists on B5. You are going to lose that pawn. Yeah, or you're going to get rid of your light squared bishop, which is the integral part of your position. Without it, all of these light squares are uh, totally under White's control. And he does play bishop B7, so he's going head first down this line. And Eric oh. keeps the tension. He doesn't go for it. That Couldn't gives Black a golden opportunity to stabilize. At the very least, you could have taken on C6, traded queens, and then play knight d4. Knight d4. Like and right you're now, just winning the pawn on b5. DC, Do it. Yeah, because dc, queen c6, you still have knight d4. There's but, but, no checkmate lined up. Your bishop on f1. If Ben is still here, he'll be very happy about that piece because it protects <sighs> g2. Wait a minute. What? There's no, yeah, <laughs> there's no checkmate, Levy. Oh, this is just a very one sided game right now. He just, I mean, that took a complete 180 because after he played b5, first of all, I missed d5. But even after d5, there was no reason for Black to lose in three moves. Well, I don't know if you just caught his hand gesture, but he went like, like, like what? Really, what's, Riley? Yeah, what's <laughs> this hand doing over here? You're making moves, but they're all bad. So in the words of James Candy, that's not a move. And he is about to be down two pawns after queen takes a4. But when Michael Jordan looked at his hand like that, it was after he hit a sixth three-pointer in a critical playoff game. So Sorry, you say Michael can Jordan meet a bunch of different six three-pointers? I don't know if we're talking about the same player. With no, all, I think there was that famous to, playoff game. Not to go all Mark Jackson on you, but with all due respect, Michael Jordan, <laughs> <Right>. three-point shooting. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wasn't a three-point shooter, but he had that one game. It was either five or six threes. Hey, you. I've been binging the last dance, so I, I got feel you. like I'm yeah, you're a year late. Michael Jordan expert. You're a year late, but I welcome you to the party. <clears throat> Excellent show. And what is not excellent for black is the fact that white has a queen side and black does not. Yeah, so b3, just kick that knight out of there, then pick a pawn and... Wait, where's the knight it's going, plus, by the way? Oh, wait, this is resignable. This is <laughs> yeah. nasty. Eric with a very clinical move. Rook ad1, going for the open file. I guess it takes away the d3 retreat once the knight eventually has to, sadly, go to b2 after you play pawn to b3. In terms of quality, this was definitely the the poorest game of the match, and Levy's not going to be happy. B3 and then Rook D2. And if you have to take on A2, you get back rank checkmated, Rook D8 check, and Bishop H6 Bishop at the end. Six. And Eric, one more accurate move to find, and I think Levy is simply going to resign in this position. Is yep, Eric's taking a drink. <laughs> you know what that him. means. It never fails. I saw him sit up, too. and I was going to make a joke. I'm like, Donna, is he about to take that? post-victory sip and the answer is he he got the win on the moment in fact it's a sign of respect once you see your opponent take that drink you're like yep yeah, okay right we're done with that it's time to wrap this up and another carol's bud so uh, you're saying we have a 
positional line. Ooh. Oh, but we, we have, have this. Slightly different positional line. Now, this is a very, very well-known endgame. This has yes. been around for many years now. And I like it. At least we have a different flair to this game. In fact, Levy wasn't really getting much of anything from the white side of those positions. So he felt, let me switch it up. Even And Eric, he did a little bit of a different move order from his white game. So the players probably studied the openings during the break, and we'll see how they react going forward. The only thing I know is that Vladimir Kramnik is a very big specialist in this end game. I think really for both colors. And a lot of people would look at this and say, well, wait a minute. Black has this totally damaged pawn structure on the king side. What does he have to show for it? And there is a variety of smaller, more subtle factors that uh, give Black's position this famed solidity and make it incredibly hard to crack. And you know what Eric's been doing in these games? With A5, A4, B5, Knight mm -hmm. D7, Knight B6. We talked about all that kind of stuff. That's what you do in a position like this where your king side, it doesn't look very good, but it is hard to get at, as you were saying. And for Levy, he wants to take control of the square in front of the isolated pawns. Those double pawns there, you want to get a knight on f5. And that's why Eric quickly went knight to b6. If you ever trade bishops, let my knight hop into c4. But he's played b3, restricting the knight, but he's also weakened his own knight. And now this a5, a4 idea contains a little bit more venom, especially if it's played after Eric coordinates his rooks. And look at the clock, by the way. Eric, it's only been 10 seconds. Now, more because he's on the move. But Levy is down a minute at this point, And it feels like Eric's a little bit more comfortable with the dynamics of this opening. It's funny how many times across various openings we've had games where Eric is just sort of focusing on finding a good spot for his knight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, this knight said, OK, I've done my duties on b6. Let's go back to c8, probably go to d6 after he's just developed his bishop, maybe into e4 later. and. Yeah, the pawn structure does not look good, but those pieces, they're about to get active. Right, and the knight is coming to d6, but if you play it prematurely, maybe white will even have something like knight a2, trying to go after this bishop, and so he drops it back to e7 first, and knight d6 is on tap. But you can play moves like knight g3, and after knight d6, play e4. Ooh. I know you don't want to give yourself an isolated pawn, but if you can trade knights, right, that is a huge uh, accomplishment from white's perspective. Because black will be saddled with a terrible bishop. And as you were indicating earlier, white will get full control, total dominance over the f5 square. And what that will mean is that the h6 pawn is going to be a permanent problem for black. It's going to tie down the rook. And here goes another pawn move. Levy missed the opportunity. He yeah, should have e played it on the move before. e4 was a, a big move there. And, and look at this. Eric is just improving his pieces one by one. And don't neglect the queen side. The action has been taking place in the f5 square over here on the king side. But watch out for rook b8 and pawn to b5, and maybe rook h8, rook h to b8, and then pawn to b5. Yeah, I mean, Eric just seems to be an order of magnitude more comfortable with the basic ideas of the line uh, in comparison to Levy, who now drops to below a minute. And knight takes e4. It's not a bad choice, but it's a choice you never want to make from White's perspective. The whole point of this opening and giving up initially the bishop pair, and now just a lone bishop, is that you saddle your opponent with doubled isolated pawns so to take on e4 and allow f takes e4 to happen it seems unthinkable and yet it's perfectly okay because it's hard for black to target your remaining pawns yeah white's still incredibly solid but the clock worries me the most levy is taking 15 seconds a move and at some point things are going to heat up in fact they're heating up right uh, now bishop He's takes weak. c3 oh and if f takes e4 there's an intermezzo yes and you take uh -oh. an e4 with a check after that very important good catch and if you take but, back on C3 the knight, G3 hangs in. Rook G1, F4. He takes F4. You can swing the knight back to F5. And now it's white's pawn structure, which is ruined. Oh, yeah. And he's played it. This is going to happen. This exact position, I think, is going to occur on the board. So knight G3, rook G1, F4. Maybe there's rook H4 after F4, just to try to win that pawn with your rook. But he goes Ooh. rook G7. Oh, that's a great move. Oh, and if knight E2, then you double just in time. And then rook g2. He takes h5. Ah, the h5 pawn hangs. Super important detail. And that's so easy to miss, Robert, because you're like, okay, knight takes e2, rook takes g7. And it's so easy to, to miss these retreating knight moves. Agreed. Now it's up to Eric to find rook ag8, and he does. And look at his time management. And Wait, is he, there knight h5 anyway? There is knight h5, and knight takes f4. Although that might not be super easy to win. And white can actually play knight takes h5 and knight f6 if he wants. Mm -hmm. You're a mean guy. Yeah. 
What about knight e2 no, I, here I instead? I like that for black. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> no, because you that want to keep you... this pot alive. Yeah, you want to keep the file closed. Exactly. No, that's and look a... at that. that. That was the wrong move. Oh! There was a minus... Oh, and this is just winning for black? Wait, so what just happened there? So this is rook. winning because black is going around and winning b3. Yes, and if king d3, you can just go rook f2, and if your best move is rook h3 there, well, that's very sad. So apparently, the move was knight takes h5. The only chance was to not allow white's pawn structure in the center to get as damaged as it did. And, and was, this was drawing chances. Was knight e I wonder if we could check out for the game, but I was wondering yeah. if knight e2 was the better try. I think it was, because with a pawn on h5, white's rook would have been permanently saddled. Mm-hmm. And now it's a matter of technique. Still not totally over, right? Minus five in such positions is quite misleading. Right, because it's only one extra pawn for right. black. And now is a problem, because if you go king e3, there's rook to b2. So essentially, white has to make like king c3, king d3, and rook h3, rook g4. b4, and rook b2. b4, rook b2. Easy. <laughs> no stalemates in sight. He still has over a minute on the clock, and the win is elementary, my dear Watson. I appreciate you calling Rosen. me your dear, but that you call me Watson hurts a little bit, especially after I had a commentator loan yesterday. <laughs> uh, but yeah. no, this I was touring. I was touring a bunch of different homes. Yeah, I, I will forgive you. So this position, you can just take on a four. Who cares about f seven? It's all about creating pass pawns on the queen side. So take on a four, and then your pawns will help each other out. Right. And there's a sign of four extra pawns. Is it four? Your all of my pawns in the last one minute have flown over your head. What, I made a pawn about Holmes. Yeah, I heard that one. And Conan Doyle, I think there's a Sherlock Holmes story called the Sign of Four. Got it. Never. If I'm not mistaken. Never got that one. Sorry. Yeah, I was kind of a Sherlock Holmes nerd at some point. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. But right now. Four extra pawns are actually well, not three. <laughs> right. You actually did okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just king goes up. The white king is cut off, so this is now simple. Okay, and they have been resigning very late in this match, <laughs> which I like. Now, and should Le we go back and, and review that moment? Yes, and I was just to say, isn't Levy facing his first deficit of the match? I believe he is. It's been wire to wire so far. Oh. Okay, so first question, was this move 92? And you are absolutely correct. This is the top move. Very, very instructive. Yeah, because the rooks are staring at each other, and you want to take on f4 anyway, but the white rook doesn't have activity, and you make that pawn structure bad. And if instead of a rook takes g7, there was knight takes e2 back there, you take on g1, and once these trades happen, that rook on h2 is passive, the rook on g1 is active, and black can go pawn hunting. And after knight takes h5, the decisive mistake for Levy, he didn't take on h5, which he should have, knight f6 check. This drags the rook back to g8, and more importantly, it leaves black with weaknesses on the king side, the weak f5 pawn. And if black goes back to g2, white can make a move like f4, and he keeps very reasonable drawing chances. The rook on h6 is also tying down the b pawn. For sure. Normally, I would rush us back to uh, the current game, but I'm looking at it you know, over there, and it's something familiar <laughs> oh done get me out of here <laughs> <laughs> they're repeating this line and it's plus 2.1 so that's not good news for levy and no. he's you know we're going back to this Karakan, hoping that it can be a solid choice for him and yet d5 right now was possible he said goes knight h4 I can get behind that. Don't go back to e6. And I mean, one typical idea in such positions is to reposition the bishop to f4 because the queen is very cramped. It's also tied down to the knight. And the knight itself doesn't have any good squares. Right. And Black's position is just bad in, other, in simpler words. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, very passive. Your pieces are stepping on each other's toes. I like g3. So does Eric. Love g3. And I wonder if Levy's going to play g5. Not a move that you necessarily want to play the knight is forced back and you at least feel like you've accomplished something yeah hey i feel like i've accomplished something every morning after i brush my teeth so i don't know if that's a when good you, a good way to play chess by every morning do you mean like afternoon because right you, you i mean one one or two p.m okay just checking uh, i had a, a lesson before the commentary and my students said 
you know, I, I blundered a queen as I usually do. And he said, and I said, it's morning for me. And he's on the West Coast. He says, no, it's morning for me. It's 11 a.m. for you. I'm like, you don't understand. A grandmaster's definition of the morning is very, very different from that of the average member of society. It's true. Morning Late extends sleep. to 2 or 3 p.m. In fact, it's still basically morning. <laughs> well, uh, we might be mourning a peace loss after G5 here because that <laughs> good, was the threat. Good. The knight retreats back to F3, and C5 is on the docket as well. The B7 pawn is feeling loose, so that's why... Levy plays bishop to b4. I really like that. It's taking control of a square. When there are pawns two uh, files apart like this on a4 and c4, the square in between usually is your opponent's for the taking. Yeah, but there's an important point made by the Greek philosopher Robertus Hessus thousands of years ago, which is that black can never really put a rook on b8, which creates fundamental underlying issues with a pawn on b7. So anytime this bishop moves away, you have to reckon with c5 because the knight doesn't have a good square. The entire queenside construction right now is really held together by this bishop. You need to find a way to keep this bishop on b4 for the foreseeable future. And part of the issue is something that you've been highlighting all match is that now the bishop's covering the queen side, but what about the king side, right? Those dark squares around the black king could be a yeah. problem. So you need to watch out for that as this game continues. But you just also pointed the g4 The light square. squares are on white's king, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like both sides have their struggles here. Whoa. And that move whoa, 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 whoa. A4 hangs. Blunder. Huge blunder. A4 hangs. Just and Eric realizes it. And he goes queen e3, but don't take on c4 with your knight, at least. Because after bishop c4, pawn takes c4, look down the d file. There's a problem there. You're going to lose a piece. Yeah, white's just going to play queen d4 and pick off this bishop. So what should black do? DC looks incredibly scary, but it might be fine. He plays bishop takes a4, so we're going to see b3. Mm-hmm. He's probably going to drag this bishop back to c6 to uh, defend the d5 pawn as well as he can. So did black just steal two pawns? Yeah, I right? A, d5 and a4. So it doesn't feel like two pawns. And I think Eric, he's trying to speed up a little bit. He puts queen on d4, <laughs> keeping black's pieces honest. f6 is loose. Uh, the knight on b6, if you have to move your queen, the d5 pawn targeted by a bunch of pieces. Not easy to play here. It really doesn't feel like white's worse at all. I and mean, if I didn't count the pawns, I would assume that the material is equal. Yeah. Just maybe it's time. Yeah, I like this move. Bishop b7, just defending, supporting all of the weaknesses, preparing to consolidate. How does white apply more pressure on black's position? Because the moment you move this rook away, d takes c4 becomes possible. That's a big problem. Isn't d takes c... Not... Uh, I get I two... I think it is. Yeah, the knight f3 is hanging. So dc4 played... And you take on b6. I was thinking just taking on b3 at the end of that sequence, but f3 is, in fact, hanging. Oh, and d1 is hanging also. Yeah. Oh, queen b6 not possible. <laughs> so, and the queen <laughs> takes the a, rook takes the a. You don't even have to worry about the knight being hanging. That's this true. This is over. So all of my fears are... Oh, thank you for putting those behind me, Daniel. I appreciate that. No problem. Not Anytime. A, not a concern in the world. And oh, Levy... Eric's got some concerns with his position right now. But we talk about this often, right? If Eric loses this game, will it make him choose a new opening, even though it's not the opening's fault? He had a great position. But when Yeah, that's you... a catch-22 situation. Yeah. You keep getting good positions, and you keep losing out of them. So what you're like, you I know? need to change something. But it's not the opening's fault. Not to blame Eric. Eric, you're a great guy. Sorry, don't you know, want to make you feel worse after a loss. But it's not the opening's fault. He should keep going into this. And there's a psychological component, a pride component to it, where you don't want to be the one to admit that your preparation is inferior, that you can't deal with what your opponent has chosen to play. Right. So 3.4 seconds left here. All right, just start marching those pawns. Bishop a3 even. <laughs> Bishop a2. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop a3, knight c2, and then Bishop, Bishop e4 is a very accurate crusher. Right. You get two pieces for that rook, but you're going to lose the knight at the end with rook d1 check. So... Yeah, this looks ouch down. Rook C3, yeah, I would most have... accurate. May I suggest trading rooks also? Yeah, Rook C3 was most accurate. We'll forgive Levy for not... Wait, why is he... What Rook is he C1? doing? Oh, he's going to move his bishop. Wait, no, but then he gets a B2. Wait a minute. Is it is seven seconds? Okay, but but now th these are never as easy as they seem because amazingly, why does a blockade over the pawns? Okay, it's completely winning, of course. And the problem is you can't even like take F7. Right? The king just... But Levy... Levy should have gone, I think, h5 to fix the pawn on a, on a uh, b7 
Dark Square. Although. Oh, but now he takes. Okay. <laughs> now he gets another pass pong the other side of the board. Don't miss E4. Oh! oh H5. Oh my god. If he had taken E3, that would have actually been a draw. Bishop E5 threatened A2. So the king needs to be on B1 or on A2. He's going to take A3 at some point. No. Okay. And there are no stalemate tricks here. None. King just. Even if black promotes. Yeah. No. This is over. Saunters over bishop c3. Bishop set. What a oh. riveting king race. Oh, <laughs> stalemate. <laughs> Even match five to five. I mean, this is okay. what we expected, right? We expected these players to be neck and neck as they head towards the shortest of time controls. And aha, new opening. Yep. Applause from the audience and a Jababa London. Let's and let's see how well prepared Eric is. Eric was playing the London fantastically well against Tanya Sachdev a couple days ago. He is on the white side of that. So it's sometimes very difficult to play against an opening that you enjoy playing from the other side. But on the other hand, you're like, I play this often. I know what the best response should be. Right. And Eric, I really like his choice there. Bishop G4 is one of the newer and most annoying moves. And that's a big mistake by Levy. He confused something. He just blundered D4. Uh, yes, he did. Is he going to play G Ugh. takes F3? Get that out of my face. And Levy, <laughs> he's reeling a little bit. He won that last game, but something has been up with him in the three-minute portion. Yeah, it doesn't feel like he's confident right now. And all right, this is one of those moments, Danya, where no matter what you capture, you're going to have a bad position. So just do one. No, take Thanks. with the queen. You yeah. absolutely should take with the queen. G give yourself a chance to develop counterplay on the king side. Right. You have a bishop pair. You can throw some pawns forward, things no. like that. Absolutely. You can't spend 30 seconds, be down a pawn, and then try to work your way out of it. You just got to make that decision in five seconds. And if you're Eric, you need to develop your kingside ASAP. Bishop should come to D6, if possible. Perhaps right. Levy should try G4. He plays a Rue Lopez, the <laughs> queen on B5. I like queen to B5. It's awesome. Yeah, anytime yeah. he makes such a move, great move by Eric. Queen. Noticing that bishop takes f4 comes with check. Exactly. Those guys are going to say queen b7 looks like a free pawn because the knight c6 is hanging. Ah, those bugs. I know. It's another chess.com glitch. Well, capture <laughs> free knight. <laughs> Alerting you that your king is in check so you can't do things. Oh, gosh. What a terrible, no. terrible bug. So bishop goes to g Dragging me down. And now I just want to move my queen to c7. I'm not afraid of bishop takes f6. You know, maybe you know some sacrifices, you know, in D5. I love B, it. B8. A, preparing potentially an expansion with A6 and B5. Looks good. And what can Levy even threaten here? At some point, he might have to sacrifice a piece just to confuse Eric and make things complicated. But for now, Ugh. Ooh, H6. H6. And Bishop <laughs> takes that four check. Yep. We both said that move. I'll tell you what. Even with a pawn on D4, White's position would have been terrible. But now it's just busted. Yeah, I mean, look at... He's got no center. Look at Levy's expression. He just looks dejected right now. Yeah, he seemed a lot more confident. Something's just off about the way he's playing these last couple of games. And but the good news is the match is still tied. I mean, he's not even losing the match at the current moment, and it's not over yet. Yeah, he could have traded Queens there and maybe had some shot in the end game. But what I was going to say, Danya, is a year ago... Eric was the one who jumped out to a lead in the longer time controls, and then Levy stormed back in the bullet and eventually won in tie breaks. So this year, something is very different about Eric Rosen. His bullet rating is above 2,800. So he has really improved his speed and his skill in the quickest of time controls. And that means that Levy can't rely on taking him down once again in the one plus one segment. Great point. And he certainly can. And I think Levy realizes that and, and is perhaps thinking those exact thoughts right now and you know before you know you know how quickly you can slip into a three or four point deficit in the uh in, in an sec match yeah and we also know when comebacks are possible from even four or five points down we just saw danny wrench the other day uh, come back against justice williams oh down my four god points that match. match i was i mean i had plans i was on vacation you know my family was going on the hike. I was like, no, I am sit sitting exactly where I am with my <laughs> one Mbps Wi-Fi and watching you and Amon 
commentate. <laughs> I was not going to miss the, the the end of that match for the world. It, it was fantastic match. And I, I guess my point here is that you know, for Levy, his body language just you know, I get the sense that he's not very happy right now. But he he's tied. Even if he loses this game, it's a one point difference. So you know, he shouldn't feel too down. His spirits should still remain high. He has been playing a good match for the most part, but in this game, Don, he blundered a pawn on, what was it, move eight? It was. And I've done that before because you, you forget that you should play, um, well, you, you have to play bishop b2 or bishop b5. h3 is kind of a knee-jerk reaction, and he never really recovered. I mean, he has had zero chances this game, and that's always dejecting. Losing a game like that where right off the bat you have no chances at all, doesn't you know work wonders for your confidence right and this is as miserable as it gets you're in a two rook end game down two pawns you have the worst pawn structure with your double isolate c pawns and levy's doing a decent job just attacking one pawn then moving on to the next although it's very easy for eric to defend those pawns and g4 is a target as well yeah, the one thing you don't want to allow, you don't want to allow white to get a pass pawn anywhere on the board. Yeah, or, or allow a rook in to check the king and things like that. Right, but no doubling is dangerous because every pawn is so easily defended, as you pointed out, and he defends it with rook c6. Okay. okay. Clock. 25 seconds about. Levy continues to shuffle his rook. Eric has made no progress in the last... Eight, nine moves. Yeah, I was going to look to see if we're getting near the 50 move rule. <laughs> uh, Robert. Is this a repetition? And we're going near a three-time repetition. Oh, my God. The this is really A4 close now. to a repetition. And Rook A5. Yeah, Eric is just awkwardly defending his pawns and not stealing any of his opponents. He could have taken on G4 at some moment and then started pushing his pawns. Eric, you're up two pawns. And look at White's pawn structure. It almost feels like Black is on the defensive. And finally, <laughs> he's making some moves. But Levy blocks him again. Good and decision. he's down to 18 seconds. And he could play d4 at some point, right? Like just like right now. Yeah, just to push b5, d4, something. Stop moving <laughs> your rook on the sixth rank, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, he's just trying to defend everything. Eric is in this defensive mindset right now, and he just needs to take a pawn at random, any mini mini mo it, and push it. Just go d4. d4, d4 ah, anything. Push it. Rook c6. He, th what this is going to lead to is eventually he's going to blunder repetition. And he finally. Oh, I think now he's made a... Wait a second. Yeah, because rook d1, rook takes g4, and the ah, rook is... And now king g5, do, or h5, you can because the rook is defended. Okay, oh, here he goes again. Rook h1. Oh, my, oh my god, here we go with this again. And now he's allowed infiltration, but he's still completely winning. Right, rook h2 is a good move by Levy. And g5? g5? Oh, my oh my gosh, can you play g6? Oh, my lands. Oh, rook f2 first instead of g5 was good. Oh, and now... Rook h7, go take b7, create go a passer. It. Go for Ten it. 10 seconds. You got to go rook h7. Oh, no, no, I don't like that at all. Now f5. Rook and h8, though. Oh, my gosh. This is so annoying. King f6, rook f8 check. The rook's going over to a8 and b8. Way too close. And four seconds for Eric. Still, he should be able to win this pretty handily. Yeah, the rook e8 check. And like a rook g5 at some moment. Rook f8. Steer. Okay, missed two first. Rook is hanging now. Rook f8, tossing the king around. But rook g5. Rook, you would have rook g5, but now rook f6 was available. Oh, oh my gosh, the king. The king is not the safest. No, I thought I was gonna get in some trouble there, but now Levy down to six seconds. Five, no, he's gotta he, go. He, he's gonna lose g6. And once that pawn is gone, black's position becomes so easy to play. Yeah, nicely done here by Eric. Pushing okay, those pawns. Now it's over. Push. Yeah. Eric is taking so long. He's F2. He's F2. F2. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Levy pulling every trick out of the bag. It, it almost looks like a draw, but the king can it escape. It really does. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. Rook D7, threaten checkmate. <laughs> yeah, that's going to work. What a defensive effort by Levy. He's going to hold his head up high, but it, he never really came all that close. There was one moment there, actually, when he went G5. If he had you played, want me to bring it up? Sure, let's do that, because we know what we're getting. There. Come on, so the Gurga okay. needs it. No, We've been here all day. surprise there. We have... It's just a move oh. order issue that he was so tempted to play G5, and if he started with Rook F2, now the Rook comes to F7, and then you play G5, 
there's no way for black to protect from F3. So you're actually winning that pawn and create some issues for black. This actually might end up in a draw. Rook takes F6, then you drop back to F5. Unbelievable how close he came. Yeah. Good no catch. Sorry. What you were saying, I think, rings true, is that uh, for Levy, he lost the game. But then you start remembering, I was close there versus I blundered upon a move eight. And why do we keep getting this position? Well, from Levy's perspective, he's winning most of the games that he gets here. From Eric's perspective, he's much better. So they're at a standoff. Whoa, queen b5. Careful now. Yeah, rook f to c8. Careful now. <laughs> Don't go b3, bishop d7-ing here. Mm. This looks <laughs> a little wrong. And just I'm going to quickly call out Levy's friends. Not people who watch his channel, okay? okay? You don't have his contact information. But I know Levy has some friends who are watching this. So mm -hmm. if you're his friend, you got to tell him to stop playing this system. That's what I would do if I was, you know, watching a friend play a match and then they got to a break. I would call them real quick or text them and be like, stop playing that move order in the Gurganidze. It's getting you in trouble every single game. And it, it, looking forward to the bullet, because we've only got 14 minutes left, this match is flying by. This is an even worse choice in bullet and I think you'll co-sign this point, just because white can make a bunch of threads, g3, bishop, f4, any position where your opponent has a long-lasting initiative is something you want to avoid like the plague in a, in a bullet match. And surprisingly, I'm going to be distracted for a second. You know, I don't have the chat open. Are they, like, doing that thing where they're like, I'm his friend as a joke? You know, they all just say that because they want to be friends with the streamer. They're not just his friend. They're saying I'm his best friend. God, okay. Just, make, just making just sure... I DM'd him. I mean... Just making sure that the chat is always the way that they're going to be. Just no surprise there. Hey, as sure as the world turns. <laughs> so <laughs> will everybody in the chat claim to be Levy's best friend? <laughs> totally fair. I love those good old parasocial relationships. So G3 has been played. The bishop trying to come back to F4, kick the queen back to D8. Then this knight can come into E4 and into D6. This is very unpleasant for Levy. And will he play G5 just to stop bishop F4? Oh, when people ask me why I'm such a big fan of hot sauces and why I put Tabasco on my pancakes. And uh, I ask in return, why does Levy go for this line again and again? I guess he just liked that particular kind of pain. I have no <laughs> explanation for this. I mean, he keeps subjecting himself to these positions and worming his way out of it. To give him credit, he seems to know the ins and outs pretty well once he gets the bad position. But you look at this, right? And black is completely tied down. You move your knight away, you lose b7. You move your queen, you lose your knight on b6. Uh, white sort of, oh my goodness. I mean, it's a good move, but it's to have to play a move like that is just never ideal. I mean, he's trying to move his knight away. Ideally to c8. And now he can do it. He couldn't do it a moment ago because bishop b8 would have been the response. But why queen c2? I just feel like Eric... He gets these dominant positions, and then he starts playing a little too passively. If he had kept his queen on b3, let me make a random move. Knight c8 would have potentially been met with bishop b8, and queen takes b7. Maybe it's not as good as it looks, but I just feel like Eric adopts slightly the wrong mentality in these kinds of situations. Yeah, he ends up retreating a little bit, and you know that knight can go to d6. We can get a blockade. We saw this earlier in the match where Levy did lose that game in the ending, but he's because he started pushing his pawns when he had a fortress, more or less. Bishop g5 preventing rookie seven. If black can get the rook trade, then we're going to start to see the same contours as in that second game he just referenced. Whoa. Uh, wait. Talk about ugly. Was, was, it, was there a 95 was 95? There? <laughs> <laughs> I think there was, because you cannot give away the dark square bishop. No. That no, is no, just, no, no. that is Harakiri. And if you take an a4... White just plays pawn to b3, and you're going to have a loose bishop on e8. Oh, my goodness. And a loose queen. Oh, your queen's trapped, almost. Yeah, queen bishop. e3, even knight c6, simply. Yeah, just easy. Missed opportunity there, but Eric is still totally dominating. Although, the knight has come to e4. Knight can go to e5, or you can just go knight d2 if you want to flush that piece out of the center. Chat is still discussing hot sauce on pancakes. I misspoke a little bit. I put it on waffles. I, I do put maple syrup on pancakes. I do like Tabasco sauce with waffles. But French toast is better than both pancakes and waffles, right? I do love French toast as well. Those are my three breakfast items because I don't really like eggs. 
as most people in the chat know. So it's uh, pancakes, Belgian waffles, or French toast. No, French toast goes first, and then whatever you want to say after that, I'm okay. But French toast first. Right. Ha have it your way. All right, give me a Burger King ad. So, okay, the queen goes to C8. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. And you can take on E4. But, yeah, just take twice. Don't go knight G5 because of bishop D4. <laughs> that oh would be tragic. Just just take twice and okay. Now don't take twice and e4 because h3 is hanging with check. How about knight e5? Is there coming g5? Eric goes h4, so he's potentially preparing bishop takes e4, but I'm not sure I still like the underlying weakness of the light squares that's created if you take on e4. Right. He could also and play knight e5 in. as well if he wants. He but Robert, here. this is what I'm saying. He's just playing a little bit too slowly, too reluctantly in these positions, and he's giving Levy way too much activity. He's not playing slowly on the clock, at least, because he has 40-plus seconds. But you're right. It just gives – in these critical moments, he gives Levy ideas. And that king on g2 is not very happy right now with the bishop on e4 pinning the knight there. So, ooh, this is ooh. a little difficult. d6 looks totally brazen, but I'm actually trying to calculate it. Oh, I guess bishop f3 and queen c6. E bishop takes f3 oh and my queen gosh. c6. No, but now d7. Rook takes e4 Rook. and d7. Wrong move order. Rook takes e4. And he finds it. And if you take with a queen, d7, rook d8, and bishop c7 is the clutch move. And there is bishop f6. The game can oh. continue, at least for a few turns. And d6? That was a, the wrong move somehow. Apparently it was. Bishop takes... Oh, could take on b6. and just left the pawn d7. Oh, because the rook's not going anywhere. Exactly. Good point. So queen Still d5 not check... Over. People were like, oh, let me trade queens. I'm up a pawn. But the black king goes king f7, king e7, and takes that pawn on d7. And Down to oh. one second. He didn't know what to do. Levy getting his king in. Uh-oh, king e6. Yeah, black is ready to pick up the pawn. I like h5, though. Take on g6 and play knight h4. Weakening the king's side. Eric yes. down to two seconds. Good move. Oh, now hey, pawn is hanging. Knight h4. Where's oh, it weakened? Queen g7. Oh, queen g7. I take d7. Oh, he should have taken with a king. He could have taken d7, played knight e5 check, and won that pawn trading queens. Make a move. It's 95. still not over, but Eric is coming in. Queen c6? Oh, goodness. Queen e7. Knight c6, oh, knight queen, c6 a7. queen a7. Queen a7, mate. Oh, my lands. And look at Levy. He's got his eyes closed. He's just like, please make that stop. And, you know, he can make it stop if he changes his opening. Well, but he was winning, I think, for a brief instant instead of queen c6. I know that's not the point you're trying to make. Yeah, he's been but... all game just trying to parry off threats. It didn't feel comfortable for him until Eric played that d6 move. As I don't get it either. I mean, Levy has an extensive repertory. He plays the Karokan. I mean, that is his main opening. And I think he just needs a change of scenery. Well, I was going to say, at least the camera angle has made it seem like he's in a new place. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know where he is right now. Maybe still at his normal spot, but we definitely have a different camera right. angle than usual. I am the king of that. Of fake you know, buying of apartments and houses every two weeks. <laughs> you're a fraud is what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Well, look at this position. He gets his knight out to f4, so he hasn't committed his pawn to h5, and that could come in handy for white. Like, a knight h5 move at some point could be very annoying. He's already trying to trade off the light square bishops uh, to get the f5 square. The knight on c3 can walk over to e2 and then g3. So I'm liking the look of this for Levy. I know he's lost a couple games uh, in a row here, but the start of this one is feeling better for him. And he's lost a game in this precise line, if I'm not mistaken. You are not mistaken at all. And Eric, sticking to his guns, going for the same exact type of setup that he's gone for in the Carlsbad positions as well. But here gets the here comes the knight, and the other knight is going to walk its way, worm its way over to f5. The rook can lift up to h3. Robert, something feels a lot more wrong in this setup than in the previous game in this line. Yes, yeah, looking very good for Levy. And I think he just changed something. Instead of pushing that pawn up to h5 and then slowly uh, bringing his knights in the game, he figured, let me put that knight on f4. Let me trade those light square bishops. So he has the themes under control. Now we're just getting the precise move order. And king d7, apparently not a great move. I could see rook f3 being played here, going right after yeah, the pawn. I could even see why playing e4 at the right moment. For Don't sure. rule out a mating attack against that king in the center. For sure. I mean, rook f3, the king has to go to e6. Rook G3, that's an odd move. Could that have been a... 
I don't think, I think that could have been a mouse slip, could it? No, I think he just doesn't want Black to have any like moves with that rook on h7. He's just like, you're frozen. I mean, Even if objectively this isn't the best choice, practically speaking, what's Black's next move? Well, not that it really had any moves without the rook on g3. That's true. I think the Maybe. knight's doing a perfectly good job, and there's e4. But there was rook g8, I guess, to come to the defense, the f6 pawn. So maybe you're stopping that. But you're right. The rook is just stuck back there regardless. And finally, he strikes in the center. Make no mistake. Black's position is awful. Maybe you try some desperation move like f5. You have to find a way to get this rook involved. If you trade on e4, the game is essentially over. Oh, yeah. Then the knight gets to f6 and f5 played. So Eric spots it. And we'll see how Levy responds because that kind of move, you're like, that's impossible. I just played e4. You have to deal with the d5 pawn being loose. e4 also covers the f5 square. And then it's played and it just catches you off guard. And Levy does react correctly by taking in the center. This is a huge game. It's important to really cannot be overstated. Probably time for one more after this one. But with a two-point deficit and Eric's improved bullet play, Levy, ideally, uh, he definitely needs this win. Wait, he, did he just blunder f2? He did, but Eric didn't take it. Was there something wrong with it? I, I don't think so, no. I think that was just a mistake by both. It was, and now Levy is still on top, but the advantage is should not be overstated here. Black is still in the game. Yeah, that rook on h7 is a pain to look at, but what's the material? Oh, it's even material? Yeah. <laughs> I was cooking up a roast, but I will spare you. It's a good it's thing I don't how, eat meat, how mean. so your roast is not welcome. Say that again? So it's a good thing I don't eat meat because your roast is not welcome. Deep breath. <laughs> it's true. Though. Eric has somehow managed to get his knight to d6. I thought Levy had chances to play d6 and vacate the d5 square for either his rook or his knight. Now both of his pieces are sort of forlornly staring at that pawn saying, I want to be on that square. Also, what's White's plan now? Like the king on c5 is surprisingly safe for the time being at least. And Maybe you move your king out and go rook c1, but it feels like there's no immediate plan for white to execute. None. I like your idea, king b1, rook c1. I still think you should go after the king. And that knight on h5 has lost a lot of its luster, right? It can't go to f6. Now it would rather be like on a4. In fact, if it was on a4, that would be literally checkmate. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. But how does it get there? Whoa, what? whoa. That's a whoa, knight a4, rook a4. Oh. But... I don't rook. think that works, Robert. No, there's rook c3 check, as you're pointing out. Yeah, Knight c4 check? And then king b1. <laughs> oh, and everything is suspended in midair. Rook b4, a3. a3. Yeah. Oh, what a line. <laughs> yeah, everything is just hanging, and you don't take anything. You just keep kicking the pieces back. <laughs> right, you keep chasing and chasing, and this oh. is on the board. This is will, happening. Will he play king b1? This is a huge moment. I think he will. He just needs to realize he needs to not play automatically here. And the fact that he's taking his time already tells me he's going to play King B1. Yeah, because King A1. Oh, okay. And Rook B4, there's still A3. And as you're pointing out, that's covered over there. Bishop A5 is possible. And you played. still don't take anything. Rook C2. But then already Rook B4. Right, you don't have A3. But, but you do have Rook C1. And if King takes D5, there's a fork on F6. Ah, the Bishop was needed there. Indeed. That's a good call by you. I think we might see that. I'm trying to feel, figure out if there's an argument to be made for like an exchange sack, like you're moving your rook and giving up your rook on a4, but you wouldn't be able to protect your knight after that. Now, don't play a3 because if rook takes b3. So you, rook. Oh. I was going to say, is there a case to be made for this move? Because the back ring is entirely exposed. And now so knight, knight f6 and rook d5. Yeah, he's pushing that pawn, but that seems to be an error. The d8 square is covered by the bishop and the rook, so rook d8 was not necessary. Now he goes knight f6. And now rook d5 S check is happening. Gosh, this still looks so hard to defend for Eric if he pulls this off. I don't know how you could pull this off. Rook d5 check, and after king b6, rook takes f5. Oh, wow, that apparently was... Because now the bishop can rejoin the game with bishop takes f4. Don't laugh at me. There, there were oh some mating gosh. ideas as long as the rook remained on the b file. I was thinking now bishop g5. <gasps> oh, he's let this go. He's let this and go. Again, yet again, Levy has pushed a pawn too far. He's got to move or he's going to lose. And he gets it up. Knight takes g5. Okay, he's up a pawn in the end game. So he so sh still should not be losing this. I oh, he almost lost the time. Was one, rook takes one second. Bail out. 
and levy he's too experienced he will not lose under f6 check king c5 don't go back to c7 yeah check on g2 with check well will, <laughs> will now, they agree on a draw no if i'm eric i'm playing this i'm depleting the time i'm not giving levy another chance and i'm getting into the bullet with a, with a two-point lead that's a good call. The match looks at 15 seconds and counting down. So will Eric be able to burn the remaining time or will Easily. the draw be had? If he wants to, don't miss me. <laughs> <laughs> don't miss oh no. My oh my God. Rook A4 would have been they made. This so good? They're making this way too close. They're making <laughs> this fun for the masses. Now watch somebody pre-move and blunder a rook. <laughs> no. They're too, you're saying they're too experienced, but I'm saying I've seen crazier things happen. Uh, they're just going to be shuffling right. Actually, there could be a moment where if the rook goes to d5 and you go rook e8 and they go rook d3 check and you're king c4 and then black gets mated. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's so funny because the rook would be hanging there. Yeah, it's it's a help me. So it's not going to happen. But sometimes these things do. Hey, all it takes is one mouse slip. Even the greats occasionally slip up. They do say even the best fall down sometimes. This is like those Title Tuesday games. There's always that one last game remaining where somebody is trying to finagle a win out of a rook versus rook position for 800 moves. And everybody hates that person. I, it, it's universally. It's the one thing we can agree on these days. It's like those people are annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric is... I don't think he's fully aware of the match clock, I would say. He's too invested in this position. Every ounce yeah. of his being is I, going I, into the I saw a, of it. Did you see that? I saw a, like the light change on his camera which means that as soon as the game was finished, he looked to see what was up. Now he knows the match clock is done. So he had it ballparked. He knew he could waste the rest of the time. He didn't know exactly when time elapsed, but it has. That means that we are done with the three plus one. Danya, seven and a half for Eric Rosen, five and a half for Levy Rosman. What do you think that Levy needs to do in this break before he goes into the bullet? Well, he needs to look on the bright side. I'll always look on the bright side of your match against Eric Rosen. He's down by two. He's got 30 minutes. Absolutely anything can happen. You know, this isn't a four-point deficit. He's not losing by seven. It's been a close match. He needs to put the three-point segment behind him. And given his body language right now, Robert, I think, I know it sounds very superficial. It sounds very surface level, but he's got to try to stay positive. And for goodness sake, Levy, stop playing the Gurgen Idze. <laughs> well, we'll see if he does dabble with a new opening. He has been pushing pawns a little too far in critical moments, but he still is certainly in this match. The two-point spread between Levy Rosman and Eric Rosen. Don and I will be back after this break here at the I Am Not GM Speech Championship brought to you by Chess.com. Chess when I was about 16, and chess.com was the way for me. I feel like chess.com really helped me. Just having from you know the videos, the lessons, and everything that kind of goes into getting your chess game right. I would say one of the biggest lessons I learned from chess was to be intentional, right? To persevere, to make sure that every move and every step that I take is with a purpose and that I have a plan for you know the moves that I'm gonna do. I feel like the biggest correlation between chess and football is having a plan. You know, you need a game plan going into a football game, and it's the same for chess. So just being able to stick to that plan and, and to execute it to uh, perfection.
um, it's, uh, to come to fix with the draw when you have uh, well oh my goodness oh my goodness it happened right here on national television did you see that did you see that oh my goodness it's wonderful i'm hurt oh man oh my goodness bro i'm like uh, i hate chess wait a second oh he found yeah yeah oh my goodness oh my goodness The Rapid Chess Championship presented by Coinbase happens every single weekend here on Chess.com, including this coming weekend. So Saturday, mark your calendars, Hikaru Nakamura, hopefully Fabiano Caruana, and Wazi So now they're done with their Grand Chess Tour event, will join him amongst many other grandmasters taking part for this Saturday's action in the Rapid Chess Championship. And speaking of Hikaru Nakamura, Danya, heading into today, there were 26 perfect brackets coming from the I Am Not GM Speed Chess Championship. And 13 people picked Eric. 13 people predicted Levy would win. And of those 13, Hikar was one of them saying that Eric would win this matchup. What do you think? Well, so far, his prediction is aging like fine wine. But it's only a two-point lead going into the bullet. I think Levy needs a complete change of scenery. I think he needs to change his openings for both sides he needs to trust his instincts and get try to get the kinds of positions in which he feels most comfortable. Open, dynamic, tactical. Sounds reasonable. I was going to add something, but there really wasn't anything to add. He's going back to his Karo Khan. Okay, but uh, oh, I was still hoping maybe he would play a different line within the Gurganids, but I guess he just decided he was going to play this the entire match regardless, and he stuck by it. Let's see how it turns out in the bullet. Maybe I'm wrong. And look at Eric's 2832 bullet rating. Ooh. He has improved so much since last year in this time control. And we've had this position before. It's familiar to both players. That's why they have more time than they started with. Right. And we've had this about 800 times, and the bishop always comes to f5. And now Eric, he's had his struggles deciding whether to play g3, when to play g3. And he's done this before. Yeah. Queen was on b5 last time. Now it's going to a3. Either way, he's just going after the c by pawn and if rook d1 there could be a bishop c2 that you have to keep your eye on but robert look already at the clock it's already a 15 second advantage it's just not easy to find moves here for black levy shuffling his bishop toward d6 but then his king could end up really really weak along the dark squares yeah i was looking at queen b2 actually uh, instead Ugh. queen b2 now he's gonna play it well how do you defend if you have bishop b7 rook takes e7 ends the game with queen takes f6 it to follow and queen d8, there's rook takes e8, and you can't even take back with the queen. You're going to have to seed the e-file, which is oh. potentially disastrous. Knight g5 is in the air. Yeah, just take rook e1. You can also play bishop d2 to c3 at any moment. Oh. That's a fantastic idea. Levy trying to do what he can, getting his pieces over to the center. And is knight e5... Okay, now it can be played. But before, so you may even be able to sack an exchange there and go for checkmate in the dark squares. But if you play it now... now I said that with an Australian accent. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I would have responded with that four. Okay, is there rook, a sack on e5? I was looking at it, but Eric says, why do I need to? I have an extra pawn if we cut the board in half. Let me just use the open file to my advantage. And as you're pointing your arrows, you can just throw those pawns at the board. I would definitely throw an h4. Maybe not h5, but just to create a stronghold on g5. Levy continuing to scramble around the last two rows. Look at that. I mean... Ugh. His pieces are fighting for the same exact squares. Why I often say, right. when you're the side with more space, you don't want to trade pieces because look at that D7 square. Both your bishop and your knight are trying to share it. Okay, there's... And um... Eric, with an infinite supply of these improving moves, right? That is the kicker. That's what makes this position virtually impossible to play for Black and Bullet. Black doesn't have 
you know, 15 different ways that he could make small improvements, and Knight, White does. Knight C6 is always available. Absolutely, but he continues to poke and prod. Wow, there has to be something here, right? It's like just D6, bishop f fate and queen h Shove it forward. I like that even more. D7 becomes a threat when bishop takes f fate. And if knight D7, there's knight C6 trapping the queen. So to give oh, and forcing black to give up the rook. That's right. This is completely winning. But how? Because bishop d5, queen takes d6 becomes available. You don't want to lose that pawn. So rook d5 but is now bishop c6. And he gives up rook an exchange. C7. And rook takes d7. Oh, yeah, rook takes d7. Oh, he missed it. He missed oh, what? Big, big chance now. Queen c3, what queen is he doing? Queen c3, the dark squares, check and mate. Oh, Levy just completely forgot about his king there. And he's just, I, I hate to be the guy who says this because I don't like when this criticism is made of me, but it just seems like his mentality right now is not positive. No, he has had his head down for a while. I think this match has been stressing him out. And now he gets the white side of a Karakon, even though it started with D4, because of the exchanges that have happened. So uh, this position doesn't oh. look good for Levy. And for the second time that he's played the Jababalun, and the first time he blundered D4, now he's going to lose D4. And the result is not good. Now, should Eric take on B2? And I love how quickly he's making these decisions, Robert. That is really the secret sauce when it comes to playing bullet uh, fast and well. Right. And, you know, he could have taken on B2 and thought for 20 seconds and maybe it was okay. But it's, as you're saying, better to make good moves quickly than the best moves slowly in bullet. God, Eric is indeed, as someone in the chat is saying, cool as a cucumber, but a great move by Levy. And maybe Eric should just go queenside. Right, because then there's rook g8 at the end after knight takes g7, getting g2 back, and the king is not castled, so you don't really want to give up that pawn. Another great decision by Eric. He is just making money decision after money decision. This knight on a little bit lower on the clock is super annoying, though, because you want to play g6, but you don't want to see that knight end up on f6, and you don't want to bring a rook to g8 just to defend that pawn. And all of a sudden, I mean, not, yeah, knight f6, take the bishop on d7, okay. or you know, not the best bishop in the world, but you can go for it. If queen d7, there's pawn f5. But instead... Oh, there's not... Sorry, the queen was on C2. Yeah, what was... <laughs> I thought the queen was on C2. I was like, going F5. Oh, and, and then rook takes F5. Exactly. That would have been a really cool idea, actually. As Levy advances his queenside pawns, he's getting the engine rolling on the queenside. But it's that classic situation. B6, A6, and A6, B6. And he's still saddled with a bunch of weaknesses all throughout the board. Yeah, no way to break through over there on the queen side. So maybe he pushed the pawn to B5 a little too soon. Knight C1 to B3 was available to him. Bring that knight to C5. And now it just doesn't have the Whoa. same... Oh, Levy Knight. pushing pawns too quickly, Robert. <laughs> Come on, stop yeah. accusing him of things he hasn't done. Is Knight, Knight G3? G3? Uh, it's about to happen. And then a rook sack on H1. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, Knight G3. Knight G3. Missed for the time it. being. And now the oh, Knight's now gone. don't have that opportunity. Although this is still looking good for Black because the king is safe enough with that side of the board closed. And C3 is the biggest target. C3 is a target, and Black might just throw an H3 to create long-term weaknesses, which will... Basically, tie white down even further. Oh, a five hanging. A five is hanging. Oh, everything's hanging. A five, h three, the rook on f one as well. To rook f three now. Don't go rook a three. Oh, he has to stop h three. Rook f three was there. Uh, now rook g eight, rook g four, and so, twenty seconds on the clock as well. Is he going? He's trying to go rook b four just to kick. Rook takes d four. No, and the queen takes d four. Sorry. Afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, I liked it. it. Looked cool. Actually, there's queen e two after that. Oh my gosh, there is. Rook oh D4, my queen, God. queen oh, it two. works. Oh, yeah, it yeah. worked. Wow. Oh that is oh, nuts. Two, two seconds for Levy, though. No way he pulls this off. F4 and Rook takes D4. I mean, there's so many tactics connected oh. in the back rank. 1.9 seconds. Two. He has mate. White is nothing. It's just one check. And he loses another one. Wow. And Eric is on an absolute roll right now. He's playing phenomenal. But look. He's played a Scandi. I know we make fun of John Bartholomew in, in lovingly, but he at least has changed his opening. This should be refreshing for him. This absolutely, I think that's a big decision. And I think if he wins this game, that'll give him the confidence needed to completely change his other openings. But don't get your queen trapped. There's always these knight c4 ideas that are easy to miss. Yeah, knight c4 can be... Ooh, there's queen a6, oh. and there's no discovery with that knight that is incredibly effective. I don't know if he's seen that move. Eric is clearly trying to find a way to trap the queen. He definitely okay. missed it. But queen e6 is your only move here. So don't think. Why just... did he take 10 seconds? And now a queen anywhere, right? Queen go to d6, b6, just run away. Okay. He's home safe. And he's up he's got 10 more time. seconds. Yeah, no, he's doing great. 
this is a huge game. I mean, he cannot afford to lose it. He has to stop the bleeding. Oh my gosh. And, and oh. it's not a bad move, but you could tell that Eric was in that point. Like, I don't really know what to do. So let me send that pawn. Queen takes d4. I like it, but apparently it's a blunder. It's a knight blunder f3. because knight f3, queen takes g4. And then rook g1. Queen, is there rook g1? But that, it, you're giving up at least two pawns there, and there's no immediate queen trap. Oh, there's bishop f1 at the end. Oh rook my g1, God. rook g5, bishop f5. Yes, he missed it, and now levy has a huge advantage. Yeah, because white's king is now in huge trouble, and levy's up a pawn. Very easy to miss. Yeah, and look at the clock, by the way. Levy, it's what we were saying. Yeah, maybe Eric had some tactic, but it's bullet chest. He's up time. Now he's losing all sorts of material. Levy has to take this game and apply that model to all of the other bullet games. Was he lost at one point? Technically, yes. But did he put tremendous practical pressure on Eric? Yes, and now he wins a piece in the game. And Eric, you know he's keeping that match clock oh, in course. mind. Yeah, he could resign here. He's just completely losing. But he's looking at the match clock and saying, 16 and a half minutes, every second counts. And Levy has to wrap this up efficiently and Ooh. aggressively, and he does, unless Oof. he blunders the queen right now, which he doesn't. <laughs> no, he's just trading everything. Look at this. Just mop up duty. But rook d3? <laughs> <I> <laughs> Controlling the only open file, white is better. No, for sure, white is better. What is Levy doing? He's going to play rook d8 as soon as you take on b7. King g1. Yeah, no, was smart. But rook b7, he's going to give white all these passers. Yeah, he's, he's gonna lose this if he's not careful. 92 to d4, he thankfully has, because otherwise he would be in a huge trouble. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, he can check and go rook d2. And if king e3 is mate, like you gotta check, check, oh, and hope the king went up. Uh oh. Um oh my god. Oh um, my god. He's plenty he, of time. Oh, he's going for mate. He's gonna go oh, e4, 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 e3. e3. Yes, he has G8 it. Check? Then king, oh, king h6. h6. Oh, you can't take on oh, e. Oh. <gasps> Wait, e three? No, no, e three doesn't work. Just Wait, what does he do? He's gonna rook a five, take the pawn, and he's a million. Oh, but pawns. now you've got to win this. But that's gonna <laughs> take another five years. <laughs> it's gonna the take five years off his life. This is unbelievable. Why did he give up all his queen side pawns? There was no need to do that. I, fortunately for him, the rest of this game is easy. Just like throw your pawns forward. Right, any pawns. Push them. <laughs> King f five, push the pawns. And the king always squeezes its way into the crevice. But I have seen stalemate tricks in these types of positions. They can be easy to miss. A good old Rosen trap. I don't think it's happening here. 92, G2, G1. Goodbye. But still, uh, we were talking about this game being over at 16 and a half minutes. Now we're getting down to right. 14 and a half. There is plenty of time to play four games. But the concerning thing, of course, is the lack of confidence that Levy displayed in converting this advantage. But oh, no, a win is a win, and the match lead is down to three. And there was a wry smile there. He's like, okay. And look, <laughs> oh, are we going to get this positional thing again? No, we didn't get the bishop g5 line. Yeah. Uh, what is yeah. this? <laughs> bishop g3. He just, and the thing about Buller, and you can B3. attest this better than anybody, is it's not often about your specific open line. You just have to feel comfortable and you got to go. Yeah. And I literally, I would go as extreme as to say you, it doesn't even matter the evaluation of the line you play. Literally, only thing that matters is the type of position that you're getting. I mean, this looks perfectly pleasant for what he's up 10 seconds so he's putting pressure on eric on the clock he's going f4 I like it he's gonna go bishop, bishop h4. h4 he talked to cinderella the stonewall he knows this stuff he loves these positions and now he's finally on to something five followed by knight takes d7 and then bishop f6 but is that really that dangerous eric with oh, 94 nice. he's gonna have nice. f6 at the end really nicely spotted by eric oh and levy's position literally just instantly falls apart oh, oh don't he's gonna take give up a piece He's going to rook f1, I guess, but you don't have to take the piece right away. And even if you do, white doesn't really have any entry points down the f file. Queen f e7. Oh, but you're walking to a pin, so the queen can move away. So maybe queen b3? Oh, that's... Oh, that's my God. Eric is queen d on the ball. Oh, queen d3, knight takes e5. No, queen b3 is check. No, just f takes oh. e5. The queen is defended. <laughs> I'm, like, getting all in the tactical mindset. Ooh, okay. Levy's oh. still trying. A little f6 action. Mm. E d4. Queen d4. The pieces are also hanging down yeah, the queen, file. Oh, queen g4. Is, queen f7. Queen f7. Only move. Because e3 is protected by the rook. That's important. And Eric finds it again. And if g6, queen takes d4, the 97 remains defended. So he just tries to keep that knight at bay. It's still a game. Eric has 22 seconds. This pawn is really, really dangerous in bullet. 
Yeah, you might even see a bishop h6, bishop g7, just like to hang out in there. The problem is that black has so many pieces clustered on the king side, you just don't see white succeeding in this attack. Eric is doing this perfectly. Would you consider resigning here based on the match situation? Mm, it's a little, I would play a couple more moves. Oof. Yeah, I guess Pray. the pawn on f6 remains, but d4 is about to fall. The knights come back to f5. Yeah, everything else has gotten traded. At this point, I would resign. Yeah, feels pretty over, right? Because there's still plenty of time to play four games. Knight f5. He's going to take on f5, but... No. Levy has to resign. Every second is golden right now. And it's under 12 minutes of the match clock. And four-point spread. If Eric, slash when Eric, is able to convert this, you running out of time, but still enough time to play those games. Don't go queen d4, because white takes and goes f7. One last trap. And the king's and in Eric sees right through it. Now knight e3. Eric, look, the two. accuracy with which he's converting this, Robert, is really impressive. Yeah, queen f1, knight g3 would be awesome. But... And Levy, he wasted another minute, which might cost him very dearly, and the lead is back to four, and he's got to go perfect now. He does, but he's got his Scandinavian. He played this last time, and he did it well. He plays c6. Time he goes c6. Uh oh. Oh, this is a classic. That bishop is in huge trouble again. So knight e4, knight c4. Knight... Knight oh C4 my goodness. and knight takes e4, and the bishop on b4 is lost. But he doesn't see it. And he goes back to g6, so he induced a weakness. The pawn f3 is not where it wants to be. But he shouldn't have gone back to g6. He should have gone to d5. Now he's going to have to push the h-pawn and allow his entire king side to get ruined. But he's, he's got to go. Eric with a full minute on the clock, and Levy's the one in the think tank. h5, knight takes e5. He's going to give up a piece, maybe? Just, knight takes d7 first. Okay, why? What's wrong? Yeah, Winning the piece. Nothing. <laughs> knight c4, bishop g3 check. Okay, I can understand now not wanting to move your knight. No, knight b5. Oh. Queen oh my god, everything is collapsing. Queen c7. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a great move. <laughs> commentator. The first oh, of the day, goodness. though, so we, we went pretty far. Yeah, well, you know, there are Rosen traps, there are Botez gambits, and I am someone who's open to all of the above. Why is Eric not playing h5? Okay, finally he plays it. <laughs> well, that just goes to show the bishop on d6 was lost. I was trying to figure out a way to save it. There was no way. And Eric gets the 10 minutes, under 10 minutes, five game this lead. is almost mathematically over. And let me advance a bold statement. Yes. Which is that the moment, and you kind of called it, the moment Levy faced his first deficit in the match, even when it was just one point, it, it just seemed like something switched. Something did a 180 deep inside of him and he just wasn't the same after that no and he kept going back to the same repertoire it wasn't working out for him and now he's getting into a close Sicilian. so he's playing in a style that young me would appreciate and the knight comes to g5 you can just pretend to have pressure even though it doesn't really exist and it can be uncomfortable for black we see eric he's burning a lot of time here yeah and levy he's Got a mathematical chance, but that means he basically has to spend no more than 20 seconds a game. And <laughs> that's pretty hard to do. He threw that 9 g5 very quickly. I mean, Eric is spending... Huh? Castles. B5? Could have taken that pawn. Queen a5 back to c3. Right. But, I mean, you could just tell by Levy's Bishop, play. Don't, don't blow her Bishop c3! Okay. <sighs> now the knight's coming to g4. At this point, Levy's just... He's moving quickly. He knows the match situation. He knows how little time remains. And as you just said, knight g4, watch out for your knight c3. And black safely castles. And with that, I see nothing in white's position that I particularly like. You know, I really have to applaud Eric's bullet improvement. It's like a different person in comparison to the Eric of, let's say, even one year ago. Coming into the match, that was a huge storyline because that's where Levy was able to mount his comeback this year. Eric, look at that bullet rating, 2851. He is- That's a serious number. I mean, that is just a powerhouse. And he got a lead midway through that three minute segment and he has not even come close to relinquishing it. No, he's only expanded it. And now the match clock is down to seven and a half and Levy's not even better in this position. In fact, he's worse. Look at Eric go. Look at that move. He doesn't worry about F takes G6 or F6. He brings Nothing. his rook over to E8. 
And now he Fearless. takes a free pawn. Knighty to check is a possibility, trying to eliminate that bishop. Not anymore, though. Just every move is good. F5, doesn't care. My king is perfectly safe. Don't have to worry. No, this is exquisite. I mean, for some reason, it's like 30 seconds in the opening, but he's played perfectly ever since then. Yeah, he just mapped out the entire game to get to this point. <laughs> right, exactly. Now he's going to put a queen on g7. This is really, really good stuff. And, and then he's knight playing 3,000 plus level bullet. Just taking the games. Queen, knight of three check is about to happen. Knight of three check. There it is. Unbelievable. And the speed with which he's executing these tactics and winning every piece on the board. He takes the queen. He wins the game. He's up on time. All chambers are filled for Eric Rosen today. I mean, he... Oh, Ooh. or are they? Oh, he had a mate? No. Oh. What was that? Uh, okay, he's still winning. <laughs> yeah, he still will win this game. He's a past eight pawn. And in a way, that's good, because he's going to milk more time off the clock. Oh, not necessarily. Bishop e3 is checked, so that pawn was tactically defended. Oh, but c2 Here's falls. another pawn, bites the dust. And a4, a3. Yeah, you are right, actually. It is good that he blundered from a match right. perspective. You know what this reminds me of? Okay, uh, I am reminded of a situation in sports that this made me think of. Let's see if you can figure out what situation that is. The situation in which it's almost good that he didn't win immediately. In sports? I'm thinking about a situation where it is a good idea to do something similar to what Eric did here, even though he did it unintentionally. When is I'm it thinking ever... of American football. Why is it a good idea oh not God. to win? What are you talking about? Why are we getting... So it's a situation where, if let's say there's 30 seconds left on the game clock, it's a good idea to not make a touchdown in oh, order okay, to play okay. the rest of the clock if you're leading. Yeah. And by no, the way, you. Eric is uh, deliberately engineered the knight and bishop checkmate. Yeah. And why is the eval bar doing this? It's like going... <laughs> it was going haywire there. All right, now you got to do the W. Here it comes. Knight coming to F2. He's getting it into the wrong corner, but bishop F4, bishop H2, and let's see if he knows it. He's and he it. does. Knight D2, king E3, king D3. Mm -hmm. It's easy. Running out the clock. And Professionally done by Eric. Right, we don't even need to explain it. He's Is he doing chess play quick right here? Apparently he is. <laughs> right? Just saying, I, I know how to do this. Don't stand there. Now he's going to milk me. You know what he should do? He should make like another 30 moves and then milk another 30 seconds off the clock. And then he might set the record for most amount of time that a bullet game has taken. <laughs> well, he showed perfect technique and Levy, you get to see him. He's like, you know, he's streaming. He's got people who are watching his stream, but he's like, okay, Eric, job well done. Oh. You, you deserve this. And for the fans, for all of his friends, air quotes in chat, and Eric for all of his friends. And he's got a lot of them. He's a wholesome fellow. We talk about this every time we see a bomb cloud. You have to play it right back. It's really funny that that's the case, that you get this sort of game of chicken where neither side wants to be the one to be embarrassed. <laughs> I like Levy's hippo with the king on e7 instead of a knight. <laughs> right. Maybe it'll appear on e6. That would be cool. Darn it. This has turned into a very normal looking position. I guess the only abnormal thing about it is the fact that rather than castling, black has a king on g8, but I guess you could devise a scenario for that. Oh, whenever there's a queen and bishop in line with h6 pawn, right. you to castle by hand. Yes. I remember when Lyash Portish castled by hand <laughs> at the 1981 Phillips and Drew tournament in London. <laughs> Whenever he poured himself a cup of Earl Grey, or was it Lipton? I don't remember. Maybe Twinnings. Twinnings. Castle by hands. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> this position looks really good for Levy. So maybe yeah, he should have... All of us maybe should have done this from the start. Although I feel like earlier in the match, Eric would, have, <laughs> would not have played the, uh, the Bond Cloud accepted. Right. I feel like it's almost a, a, a rite of passage for... Or in, in the SEC matches for a player who's basically already lost the match to play a Bond Cloud. I feel like everybody does it now at the end of each match that, that's even halfway lopsided. Mm -hmm. You mean Wesley So does it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. If Wesley So do, does it, then we should all do it, right? The cool kids. 
well, it's going to win Levy only the second game of the bullet. Most probably, although it's still not over. No, it's a closed position, so the Rooks are not showing their dominance over the Knights just yet. Uh-oh. If now F5 the Knights going to get into G5. Yeah. <laughs> Rook takes C3. Come on. Re exchange sack in return. I think what Levy needs to do is involve, to involve his king in the game. I think he should walk it back toward the center. <laughs> <laughs> a little Petrosian king march. Mm-hmm. Hey. Oh. These kings are hanging out. Well, this actually had a purpose. Yeah, he was defending h4. Is white even worse anymore? Probably not. No, knight b5 there would have hit all sorts of pawns. Try this on for sides. Get the other knight over to g5. And then deliver some kind of checkmate. Right. Sack the rest of your pieces. I would definitely prefer to have the knights in this position. Why did he move the knight away from e6? Was he afraid the black would sack? So queen, uh -oh. D queen d3. Yeah, oh, that's... that's a tough one to swallow. Queen d3, game over. I Take on e3. Four, but you're going to lose that pawn. Yeah. And once that one's gone, black Some should... sort of a fork is going to happen here. And that, even though white has two knights, I feel like it's white who's going to get fourth. I don't know. I mean, the way Eric is holding these positions, <laughs> it's nuts how long it's taking Levy to convert. It is the last, no, it's a minute left. So we could get one more after this. Yeah, we probably will. Even with Eric's in insane abilities to milk the clock. <laughs> yeah. Eric really has improvement bullet. Like it it's honestly nuts. And it, it almost reminds me of Fabi's improvement curve. I mean, yeah. it's a different speed, different tactical vision. He's not missing anything in these games. It's not like he's just randomly oh. playing fast and missing tie in another tactic, but this time by Levy. <laughs> yeah. And it's no, still a game. The game is still going. It's going to go on for, wow, this could be our final game. If it's 30, 30 more seconds. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, and Eric has to find a way to make a bunch of moves really, really quickly and build up some clock. Nope. nope. I wonder if Queens uh -huh. yet. See, no queens yet. Yeah, he's got this. It's going to be the last game. Yeah, do we have room? <laughs> what, I don't know what, I'm, what am I saying? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was really funny. I don't know what I was even mean. But it's like the, the natural expression. I'm like, I'm trying to milk this, and he dies. He does. How did he, he does. do that? How did he do that? <laughs> he's a wizard, Harry. Knight G4, okay, H1. Come on, let me. <gasps> <laughs> okay. to me. and there it is and, and that's that the match ladies and gentlemen is the match eric rosen wins by the score of 12 and a half to seven and a half levy gives him a round of applause and i mean what a showing from eric because he actually was trailing early in the match but just by a, a point and then he found his footing in the three plus one in particular and he just crushed in the bullet. There are certain matchups that they promise to be great, and they always deliver 100% of the time. And yet again, Rosen versus Rosman delivered. It took Eric a while to get out of the gates, but I am particularly impressed with the last 30 minutes. Robert, that was an incredible bullet display. And Levy didn't play particularly badly, obviously not his best day, but man, oh man, has Eric improved, and man, oh man, was he impressive in the second half of this match. Well, man, oh, man, we'll bring both of these two men, these great common content creators, on for an interview. So we're going to head on out. They're going to join us, and you will be able to hear their thoughts after it was a thrilling matchup between Eric Rosen and Levy Rosman here at the I'm Not GM Speed Chess Championship. Yes, it's an easy and draw at this point. Why did he trade rooks? Oh my god. And, and this F6. is key. F6. F6. This is, this is Devoretsky's endgame manual. F6, and not Brandon F5. And Brandon knows it. He does. And Arsenio's going to lose. King F3. Right King now. F3 and F5. Now it's F easy. F5 and F4. Wow. Exquisite play in the endgame by Brandon Jacobson. That is a backbreaker and a heartbreaker. And what doesn't it break? You, you broke my ability to speak. But Arseni, you can't, he's got to know, even if he doesn't know that this endgame is winning, to give the Black King positioning over the White King, it's unnecessary.
And it's a pleasure to be joined by both the players here. Levy, sorry the match didn't go your way. Eric, congratulations. And my first question for you is, you seem to have improved a ton at Bullet. I mean, how much have you worked on that in the last year in this rematch against Levy? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I, I haven't really worked specifically in, in Bullet too much, apart from the last few weeks of like just trying to uh, binge as much as possible and, and get used to moving my mouse fast. But um, I, I think a big part of uh, uh, the blitz, but especially the bullet was just openings, just kind of trying to steer the game into uh, different structures or lines that I was more comfortable with. So I think that was um, kind of a, a theme of the match was kind of the, the, the battle in the opening. And then that kind of set this tone for the, the rest of the game. <laughs> uh, Naroditsky is muted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I thought, Let I thought my sound broke there. Yeah, I was like, what? Was Eric's oh. answer that profound? I mean, it was no, <laughs> my question is so profound that even if I'm silent, you should know what I'm asking. But Levy, uh, the match started pretty well for you. You were up by two at some point. Then, toward the three minute portion, things started taking a turn for the worse. What would you identify as some of the turning points when you realized that? Uh, that the match was, was sort of slipping away from you? Uh, okay, first of all, uh, I spent like the last seven or eight minutes of the bullet preparing my post-game speech because the match was, of course, lost. So first thing I have to say uh, is that I always enjoy playing against Eric. I enjoy preparing for Eric. I was looking at his openings, coming up with some interesting ideas today. And you're right, like the first six games, I was actually super happy. He kept going into the system uh, of my caro, like I felt pretty okay. And it was four, two. And I really felt like things were like smooth sailing. Um, then there was the, but I kept getting low on time, but I kept surviving. And then the, the game that I lost the last five plus one game from there, it was completely downhill. I was like a deer in headlights. And then that led me to making a really rash decision and losing in 20 moves. Then I even the score. Then I lost a pawn in a Jubava London. Like, so, uh, to be completely honest, uh, I think, um, I probably should see a sports psychologist, like 100% honesty. That's probably the best thing to do because um, like I felt my brain completely quit on me in the beginning of the three plus one um, because of two things. Number one, I just like could not see anything. And number two, uh, Eric is just unbelievably defensively resourceful. Like, I, and I'm sure you guys are also caught on to that. He's like a brick wall. Like you think you're, you're like getting a winning position and it just takes a monumental emotional and like mental effort to actually beat him. So today he was just like unbelievably on form. Um, and there was, I, I felt like I could, if I felt like I was fighting my father, I mean, it was just like, I'll be completely honest. So uh, <laughs> nothing but respect. And the last thing that I have to say is it is so cruel. Chess.com makes people play on when they're down like 10 games. I was down three and I wanted to like, I just wanted to like walk away from my computer. So y'all got to change that, man. There has to be a quit match option. Like <laughs> We literally just spoke about this yesterday and going forward, that will undoubtedly be the case. So uh, yeah, it's a good piece of advice. Uh, Eric, I have a question for you related to what Levy just said is Donnie and I caught on to Levy feeling dejected. Like we could see it in his body language. Were you looking at the Zoom call at all to see you know, how he was reacting? Or did you not catch on to the fact that he did seem to be slipping as you got into the three plus one portion? Oh, no, not at all. I, I did not have the Zoom call open. Like I, I minimized everything and muted the audio. So obviously, I, I couldn't hear him. I couldn't stream tonight him. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I tried to get in the, the mindset to just play the board and not the opponent, like even though we know each other so well and we've played probably hundreds of times online. Um, and actually like a, 
a few months ago, I sent Levy my whole repertoire because we were going to train <laughs> together before yeah, our, I, yeah, over yeah. the board tournaments. And it was all in a Google Doc. I deleted the Google Doc, but I don't know if you still like. <laughs> oh my God! You thought I was? You, you thought I'm that much of a prick? I didn't even. I didn't even look at it. No, I just oh, no. was okay. like, I decided today I would play into your QGD and uh, I, j just to give you an understanding of of like how dear in the headlights and nervous I get. When I won the bullet game down four to make it a three point game, that was like my most convincing win. On my ne very next game, I made a mental note to go back into the QGD with queen f3 and whatever. And I played bishop f4 instead of bishop g5. Like that is just how completely nervous and like brain, f I mean, it's just unbelievable. I was just, I played bishop, and then I was like, wait, this isn't what I've been playing for the last two hours. <laughs> like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, it's just, it's, Dude, um, there was an important tactic overlooked here. Eric, you shouldn't have deleted the files. You should just injected wrong analysis. Yeah, exactly. Right. You missed an opportunity there. I'll keep that in mind for next time. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> yeah, I, classic. <laughs> I, I was uh, one thing I was also thinking about when Eric was running away with the match is that I would never, ever, ever beat Eric by like six points. I feel like this would only be Eric beating me by six points, and I, I think that says a lot about uh, overall like strength and also mental fortitude. So I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just have nothing, nothing but uh, positive things to say. I hope Eric beats uh, beats Bibisara. Oh, well, she has, she still has to play Irene, I guess. So yeah, now I just hope Eric wins the whole thing because he's playing like 2,800 blitz and bullet level right now. And I think he's probably the best player remaining in the field. So it, when he's on, I don't know if he ever gets off, but like if he's on, so. I mean, I'll go through t phases where I'll, I'll play like a, a 1,200 or something. So uh, a big part of a, a match like this is to try and get into the, like, the optimal form and mindset. So um, I, I felt in better form today than usual, but uh yeah, we'll see if I can find the zone in, in the next match. Eric, one last question for you. You're going to play the winner of Danny Wrench's match against the winner of uh, Baby Zara against Irene. Uh, of those three, is there anyone in particular you're looking forward to play? And is there anyone that you're not looking forward to play? Ooh, um, I look forward to watching the matches. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to have to wait a while until my opponent is known. Uh, so. Yes. I feel like watching chess is a lot more relaxing than playing chess. But uh, yeah, I, I don't really have a preference of, of who to play. Um, but whoever I play, it'll hopefully be uh, a fun one. Such a kind person. Like, <laughs> we have Lawrence Trent on the other side of the bracket talking trash about everybody. And you're you want me to? I could be Eric's uh, anger translator. You, yeah, you know that clip ooh. with Obama's yeah. anger translator? Oh, I yeah, of course. Like... Yeah, Keen Peel, let's go. Uh, they're both trash. Like, to be honest, I just don't want to really say it. I'm not going to watch. It doesn't matter who qualifies. I'm a win anyway. D4 Bishop F4 for life. Like, let's get, let, let, let's get this shit. Let's go. Eric's just, he's going to, it's going to be him versus uh, Trent in the final. And then it will be a matchup of the, the most ludicrous and the calmest person. You know, it's going to be great. It would be fun to play Lawrence, actually. I don't think I've ever played him maybe even online. But yeah, it would be fun to play Trent, you know, like he's trash. He never wants to actually play me. He's too scared. Sorry. I was still translating. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be the first person to ever trash talk Eric Rosen in history. Oh, I tried before a little bit, but it didn't, it clearly didn't work. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, Lawrence is a good player. I like, I don't think I would trash talk him. I would just compliment him and try and give him a, a false sense of confidence I, I think what just happened is you watch what greg did trash shocking it really bad doesn't work so you're, you're you're just one of those guys who's pretending to be nice in this moment and that's Reverse your psychology yeah right oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, well it's impossible to get under your skin eric we don't want to we are happy for you levy sorry it didn't go your way but obviously you're a monster. Everyone in the chess community is behind you, and we love all the content you put out. But keep playing. We enjoy it when you, you know, get over the board as well. Thanks, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was such an awkward silence. You left me. I was like, yeah, am I muted now? You know? Uh, yeah, I was. I was. I was. Yeah, I was hoping like Daniel would like start talking, but like be be on mute again. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I I appreciate it. It's uh, it's tough. But uh, maybe we will do this tournament next time around and there will be a tiebreaker match. Uh, but uh, hopefully not. Hopefully, you know, Eric is GM by then. And uh, I was going to say, you won't qualify because you'll be a GM by then. You'll have to make it oh, to that's, the SEC. That's, that's an insult to your titles. Come on. <laughs> Come on. No.
um, yeah, I, like I, like I said, I hope commentary is good. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, all the best to, uh, to Eric, but he knows that I can just send him a message. Thanks so much, Lovey. Yeah. <laughs> so <appreciate it. laughs> yeah. Now we're just making your friendship awkward in public. So on that note, we'll let you both go. Thank you so much. Seriously. Yes. It's always fun to see you guys play and uh, Eric, congratulations. And we'll see you in the next round. Thanks so much. Bye guys. Wow, wow, wow. Well, that was a fun one indeed. Eric Rosen moves on. He gets his revenge for a year ago when he had the lead. It slipped away and Levy won in tie breaks. But Eric wins convincingly when all is said and done, 12 and a half, 7 and a half. Gosh, and I'm so looking forward to the subsequent matches. Alina Kishlinska facing Lawrence Trent. We're going to have uh, Danny Wrench playing the winner of Bibisara's match. I mean, we've got so much good stuff coming up. And... Friday, June 3rd is the date of the Kashlinska lawrence Trent match. Mark your calendars. That's not tomorrow. That's the Friday after tomorrow, next Friday. And that'll be at 4.30 a.m. Pacific time, bright and early, 7.30 a.m. Eastern. No better way to start the extended weekend. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about Lawrence Trent, Eric Rose in the final, but Alina is super strong. She's already made a final in the I'm Not Jim Speech Championship a couple years ago. So that will be a fun one indeed. And trash talking or not, it's always fun in the I Am SEC. And Donna, I think what we saw from Eric Rosen, it might make him the favorite overall in this bracket. He came in as the sixth seed, and he's number one in many fans' hearts. But I think over the board, he might be number one based on all the action we've seen thus far. And again, let me emphasize the bullet, the speed, the opening preparation. He's such a multifaceted, dynamic, resilient player. Levy pointed to how nervous Eric makes people, even when they're in a completely winning position. The way that he was able to extend some of those positions, even the games that he lost, is nothing short of incredible. Eric is a force to be reckoned with, and we will see if he meets his match. No, there were no stalemate magic, no Rosen traps. But when this match concluded, we were just thrilled that the players joined us. Eric moves on. He stays in the competition. Unfortunately for Levy, you know, he says maybe he needs to see a, a sports psychologist. That probably can be beneficial for many people in this profession. But regardless, Levy is awesome. He provides so much entertainment, so much value for the chess public. So we're thrilled to have him in any and every event. But Danya, I got to thank you, partner. Thanks for returning. Uh, you know, I didn't have to cover this one alone. It's uh, tough to be solo, but having you here as a, my co-commentator is always a pleasure. And it wasn't a tiebreak match like a year ago, but it still was a ton of fun. I could not ask for a better match to return to. It's good to be back. Likewise, uh, always, always fun and always great to get courtside seats. Uh, would have been nice to get courtside seats for the Warriors game, but I'll take courtside seats to the Rosen-Rosman match. Can't wait for the subsequent I Am Not a GM SEC matches. This is such a nice and most of the time wholesome event, well, unless we're talking about Lawrence Tran, but we'll get to that <laughs> later. We'll get to that next Friday. Yeah, that's that's from a week from tomorrow. But for now, we want to thank everybody who tuned in. Uh, we really do appreciate your continued support and attention. And while we had a happy hour with Levy and Eric, just chatting, uh, just having a good time, they have to move on, and so do we. So right now, we bid you adieu. We say goodbye. Tune in for the Women's Speeches Championship Action tomorrow, hosted on this very channel. And until next time. We'll see you soon. It's been a pleasure here at the I'm Not GM Speed Chess Championship brought to you by chess.com.
Did you know you can watch top chess events right on your phone? You don't even need to download an app. Just open any mobile browser and head to chess.com slash events. You can see what's happening right now, check out top games, see results, and so much more. Try it for yourself at chess.com slash events.